When I was a kid, I lived in a little one-story house with my dad, my older sister, and my stepmom. It was a nice and quiet place. We had hardwood floors and there was a hallway leading from the living room into where the bedrooms were. It was a rather dark hallway which turned to the left and led to a guest bedroom and my parents' bedroom. The reason it was dark was because there was just a single dim light on the ceiling between the two bathrooms and the second bedroom, which was at the end of the hallway before it turned left. There was also an attic door right above the master and bedroom's door. We never really opened it. It's weird. It just didn't feel like we had permission to, even though we did and could use it any time. I can recall one day after school I returned home to the house being empty. My sister was at a friend's house and my parents went out to try and surprise us with McDonald's before we came back home. I remember calling out my sister's name to see if she was home as well as my mom and dad's name, and no one responded. I went into my parents' bedroom where they had a computer. I sat down and started to turn it on, hoping to get a few minutes of gaming in before my parents came back. As I sat there, the room felt like it was getting darker, but I told myself that my eyes were just adjusting to the computer monitor in front of me. The computer which was taking a rather long time to boot up. Back then, I was maybe ten years old. I looked around the room to see if my eyes would adjust but it was still extremely dark, even though the light was on and it just seemed like they couldn't. It also started to feel colder and colder, and when I looked up again, the ceiling was completely black, and the darkness shrouded the light above me with a thick black haze. Immediately, I looked back at the computer to compose myself and try to ignore it. I told myself I was just a kid that was creeped out for no reason. As I focused on the monitor, the room was cold and quiet. And suddenly, a woman's voice whispered shortly and sternly, My name. I could feel the wind on my ear and the pressure of someone holding my shoulder. I bolted out of the room, and moments later, my dad came through the front door, smiling and holding a kid's meal in his hand, asking me how my day at school went. I didn't tell him what had just happened. A little while passed, and my dad began having his own experiences in the house. Sometimes he would fall asleep watching his favorite TV shows on the sofa. In the middle of the night, when we had all fallen asleep, he would wake up and hear footsteps walking around the living room. He would also hear chains being drug across the floor. At the time, we also had a dog. He said that our dog's head would follow the footsteps, and that was how he knew he wasn't just imagining it. The footsteps would lead into the kitchen, pausing for a moment before something dropped from the kitchen counter. Sometimes, when one of us was alone in the house, we would hear little girls giggling and laughing in the bathroom at the end of the hall. I remember my dad talking to some of the adults in a serious tone. He said he could see the shadows of two people from underneath the door. He would open it after no reply and there would be no one there. He would then notice that he was alone in the house. This was a common incident that many of us had experienced ourselves. My stepmom didn't like children, but she hid it very well from my dad. When he would leave for work, he would leave for 15 to 20 hour shifts. Sometimes she would put me in the basement and said if I couldn't behave myself like a person, I would be treated like an animal. The thing about being downstairs is that she would turn off the lights so that you would be downstairs and it would be completely black. It would feel like something was staring at me from the corner of the room, something that was slowly creeping closer and closer to where I was sitting. Sometimes I would hear feet dragging in the distance, accompanied by tapping sounds similar to fingernails tapping on the concrete floor. 
This only happened soon after the sun had set and the basement was once again too dark to even see my hand waving in front of my face. As the sounds came closer and closer, I would hug my legs in a fetal position. At that point, I would sing a song from Anastasia, the one that my sister and I used to sing together, and hearing my voice made me feel less alone in that situation. Even as I felt the air thicken and the feeling of something weighing in next to me, waiting for me to open my eyes and take a look. Each time that I did manage to open my eyes in an attempt to see what it was, it would still be so dark that I didn't know if something was there or not. I learned how to toughen up and deal with that thing by treating it like a bully. Just don't let it get to you, don't let it bother you, I would tell myself. But the utter relief of the light turning on and being allowed to come back upstairs and watching my dad pull into the driveway was the best feeling in the world. Another one of my stepmom's favorite punishments would once again be in the basement. She would have my sister and I fold the clothes from the laundry machine. She would later tell one of us to go upstairs and then proceed to throw all of the clothes on the ground and then tell us to fold it again by ourselves. Downstairs, my sister and I knew that something was not right. The room had a TV and a small, dusty sofa. The door would always be open, and it felt like someone or something wanted you to come inside. It was almost magnetic. At times, we would have to go into the basement room whenever my stepmom had her friends over. We had to be quiet downstairs without a peep, or else she would get upset. Due to the giggling ghosts who were upstairs, we always seemed to get the blame and were punished according to her mood. When I turned 12 or so, two of my dad's brothers moved into the house with us. One of my uncles slept in the guest bedroom, while their other uncle slept in the basement room. Sometimes we would go down there to see if he was hungry. When we entered the room, my uncle would be laying on the sofa with his eyes open, not blinking, and unresponsive. This would go on for a good hour or so. My dad said there wasn't anything downstairs, but he rarely went down there at all. My uncle said that there was something evil, and that it was trying to get into his body. My other uncle, who slept in the guest bedroom, said that when he was asleep he had a dream where a confederate soldier without eyes kept screaming that they had been taken from him. He woke to see a floating blob of light right in front of his face. I remember one night as my sister and I were falling asleep, my dad kept yelling down the hall from the living room for us to stop talking and get some rest. He said it a few more times before my sister and I said we weren't talking. He then turned off the hallway light and said good night. Moments later, I opened my eyes, and behind our bedroom door was a little girl in old pajamas. She had long black hair and nearly blended in with the shadows. I stared at her and then covered my head with my blanket. Later on, two of my cousins moved in after my uncles moved out. They had our old bedroom, and my sister and I took the guest bedroom. My cousins were both boys, and we were supposed to help them get used to living with us. They kept fighting with each other. The youngest one would climb into my bed in the middle of the night because he didn't want to fight with his older brother. We had a lock on our bedroom door, and that made him feel better. Also, he did mention that the bedroom scared him, but I didn't ask why. Eventually, the oldest one started to walk around the house at night. We found makeshift weapons like a stick with sharp rocks on it, and a strong thread with something sharp on it as well. He said he was going to kill our stepmother and everyone else in the house. He was maybe just 12 or 13 at the time. Eventually, law enforcement became involved, and he was deemed insane. Once my dad found out about my stepmother's abuse, he swiftly divorced her and we moved. We never saw her again. 
One thing I remember is while we were moving out, the landlord stopped by and had baked us all cookies. My dad asked them if anyone had died in the house. The landlords were shocked and said, yeah, there was an older lady who died from depression upstairs in the attic. They then asked my dad how he knew. He told them about our experiences. They also mentioned that the house was built on an old battleground. To this day, sometimes I drive past the house and think about knocking on the tenant's door. I work night shift at a 1920s mental hospital. Obviously, countless people have died here for various reasons. Hangings, a murder-suicide beatings, accidental overdose, electroshock therapy, etc. There are four floors, with the fourth floor being the well-known hot spot for paranormal activity. Me being security, I have to check it out every once in a while. The fourth floor is essentially an extremely long hallway, approximately 1,800 steps. With housing units, each unit has a 5-inch thick steel door, and there's a window at the very end of the hall. They don't house patients due to the fact that the county took over a while before I started, and it's completely empty by the time third shift rolls around. The fourth floor is also the only floor in the entire complex that is completely off the ground due to the complex being built into a hill. It is also where the electroshock therapy took place a long time ago. This occurrence happened last Wednesday on third shift. I wanted to do a walk through the fourth floor that night around 3 a.m. for no reason other than I was feeling brave. I walk all the way down to the window. Eventually, as I got closer, I started seeing that the window obviously needs cleaning. When I got about five feet away, all of a sudden there was a handprint that would have been extremely noticeable from even 15 feet away. I looked at the handprint, turned around, said nope, and walked back down the hall. On my way back from the window, I peek into a side office area with my flashlight just to look. Nothing. Kept going. After a couple seconds, it sounded like someone was running up behind me, so I walked even faster because everything in my body said not to turn around. As I kept walking, I passed by a unit, and as I passed, I heard what sounded like someone punching the door. Put it up to paranoia due to the running I heard prior, that is until I passed another unit. Another loud thud, as if again someone had punched the door. So at this point, I start speed walking down the hall, and while I am, I hear footsteps following mine. Mind you, these units are not connected at all, and again, the entire floor is completely empty. That's just one of my experiences. I have also been having dreams of a white, skinny woman in a hospital gown that has black hair with bangs in her face. I always thought she was just a reoccurring person in my dreams until I talked with one of the CNAs that worked tonight in the kids' unit. I never brought her up to the CNA. We were just talking about ghosts, and she said that numerous people have said that they've seen the exact woman that I had just explained. We were just talking about ghosts, and she said that numerous people have said that they've seen the exact woman that I just explained. I then explained to the CNA in detail about how she looked in my dreams, and she just went pale and her mouth hung open. Supposedly, this ghost is extremely well known throughout the hospital by various people. People have seen her in mirrors, have been locked in bathrooms, and have seen her just walking around. But in my dreams, she always just appears or runs up to me, grabs me, and screams in my face. There was this one dream in particular where I woke up from a dream to wake up in my duplex's stairway. I walk down the stairs, because that's where my bedroom is, and walk into my bedroom. Once in there, I see my bed, my fiancé sleeping on her side of the bed, and myself also sleeping. In front of my closet, which is on my side of the bed, I see that same woman standing next to my body, just staring at me. I walk up to her, and I get the courage to ask her just who the hell she is. She looks at me, grabs me, 
screams in my face, then shoves me onto my bed, which is when I officially woke up at 3.15 a.m. I have no clue who this woman is at all, but I still dream about her every now and then. Every single dream is in a different place, but she's just there, and this has been going on since I started working at my job. This happened to me back in 2008 when I was 14, so my memory is a little fuzzy. My mom, brother, and I drove deep into the sticks of Tennessee from Texas to visit. We were only staying for the weekend. My mom, aunt, and grandmother were talking, and I don't know how we got to this conversation, but my aunt was telling me how she heard about this abandoned church that was supposedly haunted. If you went to the church and took the stick that kept the door closed and put it somewhere else, when you came back, it would be in its original place. There was a statue of an angel, and if you shined a light in its eyes at night, they would bleed. She was spending the night at a friend's house, and her friend also had another friend over that she wasn't familiar with. Her two friends decided to go out to this church at night, in the early hours of the morning. It was pitch black because it's out in the country. They lay a Ouija board on the truck and start asking questions. Basically, some spirit named John says that he was murdered by a gunshot some year in the early 1800s. I swear in this town there are more dead people than there are alive people. I don't actually know that, but it sure seems like it. The last question that they asked was, where are you? and the planchette flew off the board. They decided they didn't want to look for it. Part of me wonders if it's still at the church and where it would be. So they checked the gravestones nearby and found John. Then they thought that they heard a gunshot and ran back to the truck and went home. I said I wanted to go to the church. She took me, my brother, and my cousin who were the same age it was about a 45-minute drive to get there, and the road that it was on was empty, nothing but grass. There was no way that you could walk there. Across the street was a field that went on for miles, and on either side of the church was just grass and trees. No street lights. So when we get there, it's a one-room, white, little church. It's surrounded by trees toward the outside of the fence. The fence was black iron, and the opening was big enough for trucks to come through. We saw the creepy angel statue that my aunt had mentioned. We thought it looked like the Reaper. We pull up, and the gate is already open. Immediately, my brother and my cousin, who were in the back seat, were like, Oh no, we are not going in there. And my aunt was saying, Why is the gate open? I just don't understand. And I had my hand on the handle, and I looked at the gate and I knew that something was waiting for me on the other side. I could see, maybe my mind made it up, but I didn't see it with my physical eyes, a ghostly white man with yellow crooked teeth maliciously smiling at me. So I take my hand off the handle and say, okay, I want to go home. So my aunt backed out and went down the road a little bit further and the closest thing next to us to turn around at because there were little ditches on the side of the road in case it rains, was another graveyard. Not surprising. We passed by the church, and I wasn't expecting her to stop, but she did to take a photo with a digital camera, and the door was open to the church. We were all freaked out, and I swear I had this feeling like we needed to leave because something was going to chase us. When we got home, the three of us couldn't stop looking at the camera, the thing I remembered the most was that the treetops grew into a face. It looked like a big bald man with a crooked nose and a narrow chin. When my aunt got the picture developed, there were four orbs. One by the gate, one by the door, and two by the window. My brother and cousin swore that they had seen green eyes looking out of that window. I didn't sleep that night. I felt like something was hovering over me, waiting for me to fall asleep. 
I kept praying that nothing would happen. I tried watching TV to shake it off, but damn, there was no shaking it. I didn't sleep until I got back to Texas. That was my last night in Tennessee, and when I went back home, I slept with my light on every night for a while. And while we were there, I could just sense this unbelievable amount of hate from whatever was there. It was so aggressive and ready to attack. That feeling just pierced through you. That's my only experience. I will never doubt that there is a spirit world after that. My aunt sent me the picture, but I tore it up in 2012 because I was afraid that it would bring something bad into the house. I was 15 when the first time anything paranormal happened to me at this boarding school. For a month, I would have sleep paralysis. The next month, it got 10 times worse. As well as sleep paralysis, I would feel someone or something patting my head. I would open my eyes, and no one was there. This would carry on for a little while, until one night when I had sleep paralysis again and I looked over to the other side of the room and saw a slightly washed out figure of a woman wearing a maid's costume. This happened for a couple more nights until I left that school. I came back to that school for sixth form, the last two years of high school if you're American. It all started up again when I was moved into that same dorm, but this time she followed me around the school. In the end, I prayed for her. However, she still follows me around when I wear a certain necklace to this day. The last story I have is about 18-year-old me messing around with a Ouija board. Please don't do this. So my boyfriend at the time was the one who bought the Ouija board. A good friend had just died a couple of months ago. We messed around with it for a little bit until the planchette started to levitate. I somehow went into a trance for what felt like about 30 seconds. However, I got told it was for five minutes. When I came out of this trance, I had three scratches down my arm. The hand with scratches was red hot to the touch, but the other was ice cold. Of course, we decided to do it again the next night. Something predicted the future. The first thing it said was fire alarm. The next thing was knee surgery. And the last was asylum. As soon as this happened, the fire alarm went off. A year later, I had knee surgery. And then six months later, my ex was admitted to a mental facility. I know this sounds far-fetched, but this is what happened. Again, please don't mess around with Ouija boards. About a month ago, I started a new job doing security at a local community college. Being the new guy, I was pretty much shafted with the night shift right off the bat. Normally, I work from 10 p.m. to 6 a.m. on weekdays, and 6 p.m. to 6 a.m. on the weekends. It's a nice job, good pay, plenty of overtime. The campus doesn't have dorms, and I'm the only one here at night. It gets lonely and very quiet. Watching the security cameras is monotonous, and patrolling the empty dark halls can only be done for so long before boredom really starts to set in. When I first started, I had the expectation that I would be given the worst shift at the worst times. And I was right. I was put on the night schedule before I even got to see the place, really. It used to be an old Catholic academy for girls until the late 60s. 
It isn't particularly secluded, but more suburban. It sits up on a hill overlooking a highway. It has five floors in the new part of the building, four floors in the old convent and chapel wings. It was first opened in the 1890s by a religious order of nuns, particularly for young ladies who also wanted to be nuns. It grew out of that until eventually attendance dwindled and it was sold to the state, who in turn converted it into a community college after almost a decade of disrepair. I'm not someone who dabbles in the occult or knows a lot about the supernatural. I mind my own business and try to do my job. But recently, this place has got me in rare form. I don't scare easily now. But just in the short time that I have worked here, I've started to think that something is up. The security cameras are typical CCTV cameras. No audio recordings. But in the monitor, I'll hear a crackling like static. There's no way to enable or disable audio on the monitor. It comes and goes. I'll hear footsteps like leather soles clopping down the hallways through the security monitor. When I go on patrols in the convent wing, the lockers that are typically reserved for the cleaning crew and faculty staff will be unlocked and wide open. I've seen them open on the cameras, but only my supervisor can play back the footage. Doors that I know I locked during my first patrol will then be unlocked and open on the third patrol. The motion sensors will detect something and turn on when I'm not even on that floor, and when I am, sometimes they don't even react to when I move down the hall. And when I go to what is now the library, it used to be the chapel, I can hear piano music coming from the hall where I had just came from. I don't really drink anymore. I don't do any drugs, prescribed or not. There's no history of mental illness, and this isn't just a one-time thing. I'm not sure how to tell my supervisor about it without sounding mad or cowardly. I don't even know if I'm posting this in the right area. Only four more hours left in my shift, anyway. One night, I was working a night shift in a refinery. I was working as a quote-unquote hole watch for my shift, which means I basically sit at an entrance and document anyone that goes in and out. While well, a guy showed up, I got his name, and he gave me the company that he worked for, so I logged him in. Everything checked out, so I'm waiting at the entrance for a few hours for the guy to come back out. Now, that's nothing unusual, because most of the people that go in will stay in there between two to six hours at a time, and every hour or two I yell up to make sure that they're okay. I would yell, and usually the guys whistle back or make a noise to let me know that everything's alright, and every time I check, I thought I heard a response. A few more guys came up to go in. I log them in, let them know that there's another guy up there doing inspections. They go in and radio back, Hey, there's no one in here. Immediately, I had a weird feeling because I was at the only exit entrance, so there's no possible way to get out of the container without me seeing. The way the container is set up, you have to climb up a ladder to get into it from underneath using a scaffold to help. I was sitting on the scaffold far back enough to where if anybody came out, they would drop down right in front of me, and the only way off of it was to go through the gate opening that I was guarding. So I radio my foreman and explain to him what had happened. He got into contact with the company and they had no one by that name and no one scheduled to check that particular container. I was completely baffled at this point. Here I am, adamant as ever that someone went up into that container. I thought I was going crazy and I was also a little weirded out. I had a signature on the log where they sign in, and I have to sign right next to their name also, acknowledging that I know that they're going in. For about 20 minutes, I'm in full panic mode and freaking out because I don't have an explanation as to what happened, or where he went, or who he was. And on top of that, I could have easily lost my job because of it.
I'm employed as a policeman, and I work the night shift in a tiny little town. The population here barely breaks a thousand. Needless to say, I know the town well enough to be able to tell when something is wrong. Near the center of the town, there's the old school they used before they built the new elementary and high schools. The building is listed as a historical site and can't be demolished, but due to asbestos, renovations would cost the town too much to be worth the work. This school sits within feet of the public library, and behind it sits the town's fairground. It isn't an official fairground, but every year they had bull riding and small shows that they would put on for kids during the summer. With all of those details out of the way, I will explain what happened. I noticed the backlight to the library on, which is not normal since it wasn't on all night, and it isn't a motion light, so I parked on the north side of the old school grounds. I walked through the fence and had to pass the school to get to the library. I would stop every few feet and listen because the gravel was so loud. When I stopped the second or third time, I thought I heard a squeal in the school, like the sound of a door. At first, I didn't think anything of it, since I figured I was hearing things. The town just replaced all the windows on this building, so I thought I wouldn't be able to hear the inside. When I investigated the light and found all the doors locked, I started walking back around to my car. As I passed by the school again, I heard a noise in the building again, and I stopped and listened. And as I shined my light, I noticed a basement window was broken out. So when I walked up to the window, I looked down and in and didn't see anything. I kept walking and I heard the squeal again. It reminded me of those bathroom doors in schools that the hinges always squealed really loud and echoed. When I came around the corner, I saw two cats roughhousing in the dirt. They stopped to watch me and then both of them turned and looked at the door. I couldn't see for myself because it was around another corner. One hissed, and they both bolted away from the school, which put me on edge. I know this school is absolutely not in use, nor are there any plans to use this school anytime soon. Also, the local kids and homeless don't come here, ever. It's a landmark the city as a whole really admires, and there hasn't ever been an issue with breaking and entering, at least not for a long time. So when I came around the corner, I saw the door and I walked up to it to see what the cats had run from. I looked for other animals, but that didn't make sense because they looked up as if someone were standing in the window of the door. Not like they would if it were a raccoon or a dog that ran off without me seeing. When I looked in the window with my light, I could see a gigantic raggedy Anne painted on the wall and I assumed this was the kindergarten section or something. And then I stepped back from the door getting ready to leave, and I heard whistling. It wasn't really loud, but it was loud enough to make me stop. That little voice in the back of my head was talking now and telling me I was just hearing things, but the dude that likes the dump of fear of the unknown told me to go back to the door. So I went back and listened again, and I know it was whistling and not like the squeak of an animal or an object from inside. It got louder when I came to the door again, and it had a tune, but I don't know how to describe it. So now thinking someone is in the school, I went around and checked all the doors, including the second floor door that I had to climb the rusty metal stairs that were more like a death trap to see in through. When I couldn't find a way into the school, I checked it all over again, and when I left, I couldn't figure out what it was. The whistling had stopped, and I even hung around outside for a few minutes without my light on, just watching, figuring out if someone was in there. They would eventually need to use a light to get around or to get back out, but there was nothing after twenty or so minutes. So I got in my car, circled the block, and parked down the way with my lights off to watch for someone to come out at some point. But no one did, and there haven't been any lights on. I know this story seems kind of boring compared to the others, but working nights gets you on edge. And for all the things I know I experienced before, this was in my top five bone-chilling moments while on the job.
Not entirely my story, but the main event happened to my mom when she lived at home with my grandparents. Back when she was a teen, they had a beagle that would often stare down the hallway and growl at nothing, the whole deal. In the middle of the night while lying in bed, my mom heard the dog begin to growl just before she felt someone grab her by the ankles and begin to yank her out of her bed. She says she was halfway pulled onto the carpet before she started saying the Lord's Prayer and the hands let go of her, but her dog was still going absolutely nuts. There have been other little things that have happened there too involving other people in my family. No one seems immensely worried about it, but I've always had the feeling of being watched in that house, even before knowing some of the stories I've heard now that I'm older. It's always the same one. My grandparents have lived in it since it was built when they were first married, so no bad history of the house itself, but perhaps the land that it's on? My grandma has told us stories about seeing shadow figures walking down the hall. My brother smelled my grandpa's cigar smoke in the kitchen during a family event. My grandpa had passed away a couple of years ago. Used to always smoke a certain brand of cigar outside on the back porch. And I once was startled by a loud, raspy cough right behind me while I sat in the empty house playing computer games with the speakers off. Recently, my mom and I had installed some cameras in the basement and on the front and back porches, just for extra security. I'm dreading the day, my grandma tells us one of them caught something and I'll have to see it with my own eyes. I was in a nearby abandoned Navy hospital with several friends. We had been in many times before and never had anything odd happen. We were on the top, the third floor and there were many broken windows, allowing the rain and nature in. There was a lot of mold and even moss growing in the old ceiling tiles that covered the floor at this point. One of our group, prone to asthma and respiratory issues, didn't take it too well. We all decided it was best to leave and began our descent into the basement, which was the route to the exit. This is when things got weird. I broke ahead of the group, Something generally against our rules of exploring, but in my mind, I had to get out. I was far enough ahead, around corners and such, that I couldn't even see their flashlights behind me anymore. My heart was racing, and I still don't know why. I finally got to the last door that led to the room that we would exit from. It was a heavier door that closed by itself. I reached for the doorknob, but something stopped me. I couldn't do it. Something in my mind wasn't letting me put my hand on the knob. All I felt was terror. I'm not sure how long I stood there, shaking with my hand no more than three inches away, before I saw the flashlights of my friends at the end of the hallway, and at last I could do it. I wrenched the door open and immediately went outside, hyperventilating with panic. My friends soon joined me, also saying something felt a little weird in there that time. We were gathering outside the door when the friend with the breathing issues felt something on her shoulder. We pulled down her shirt and there was a noticeable, quite obvious, handprint. Nobody touched her, especially not hard enough to leave a full handprint through clothing. We've been back several times and haven't had another experience in any way, which only makes it even more odd, if you ask me. I recently had an experience that I'm... Well, that I'm just not sure about. I tried explaining it to my sister and I can't even begin to put into words everything that happened and how I felt. 
So recently I went on a bit of a road trip and visited a bunch of places in the Southwest, Utah and Colorado, Arizona, and Southern California. I stopped at a park in Colorado that I hadn't initially planned on going to, but had never been to, a place well known for its Native American history. It was absolutely beautiful. Honestly, it was amazing and humbling to see the history of the people there. It made me realize that there was so much more about American history than the rather Eurocentric view of colonialism that I was taught. Anyways, like I said, it was amazing. Given that this was November and very off-season, half the park was inaccessible and attendance was minimal. There were other people, but overall it was very quiet. I had been viewing some building ruins atop the mesa, one huge multi-room building, and not that far away another large building with a very large kiva in the middle, and on the southern side of the building, number two, was a solstice carving on the wall. I was walking around the smaller solstice building, as there was a couple walking around the large building, and I enjoyed the quietness of being alone. And when I went to the large building, they went to the solstice building, and then they left and I was going back to the solstice building to get some more pics of the solstice marker. I was now alone. It's hard to describe exactly what I felt and how everything went down, but I'll try. It was a pretty nice day, temperature in the upper mid-fifties. I'm from the Midwest, so that's still short weather to me. Some light, small clouds, but not many, pleasant breeze, and a few birds chirping away, and more than a few chipmunks all over the place. As I walked around the solstice building, everything just became... still. Like the wind stopped, the animals went silent and disappeared. It was just weird. There was a large, darkish cloud that came kind of out of nowhere and just hung there. There was a weird heaviness all over. And then there was this smell like what I thought was just a dead animal. Like that sickly sweet smell of rotting meat. I assumed that there was just a dead deer or rabbit or something nearby that the wind had been blowing the smell away, but the wind was gone and everything was just still and heavy. As I reached the solstice marker wall, I noticed that on top of the wall, mind you the walls are only two foot high or so, there was a piece of pottery. I swear that this pottery had not been there before, and it wasn't there in any of my first set of pictures looking back. It was a large, broken piece, but now that I think back, it was really clean. The blacks and the whites were incredibly clear. I went and picked it up to get a closer look, and it was really beautiful. A kind of stair pattern and then an angled set of lines. It was really pretty, but it felt... off. Oddly heavy for its size. I wanted to keep it, and I wanted to take it, and just kept staring at it for what felt like... God, it's so hard to describe how I felt, but the time stood still, and all I wanted was this pottery. Even now, thinking about it, I still get this weird, like, longing for it. As I held it, everything was just silent and heavy, and that smell was just so strong. But suddenly, there was this huge raven out of nowhere. Legit, it was on the wall like five feet away from me, and it was the largest bird that I had ever seen in the wild. This huge raven just cawed and flapped its wings, and I kind of snapped back to reality. Honestly, it was bigger than a freaking condor. Its body was easily three foot tall, and its wingspan was just massive. I put the pottery piece down on the wall, back where I picked it up from, and just looked at this bird, and the bird just looked back at me, and I turned and walked away. Just like that, the dark clouds blew off, and the wind returned, and there were other birds chirping, and the smell disappeared. Actually, the smell all but vanished when the giant raven appeared. I got about ten feet away from where I had been standing, just around the corner of the solstice ruins, and I turned around to see the raven, and it was gone. I didn't hear it flap its wings to fly away, and I didn't see anything in the sky, not even a shadow on the ground. It was just gone. And so was the piece of pottery. It was no longer on the wall. I went back to my car and headed back to the visitor center, as besides being totally weirded out over what had happened, it was getting late in the day and I had a fair bit of driving to do to get to my next stop down in Arizona. I had a good 35 minutes drive back to the park entrance to reflect on what had happened and how strange I had felt. Honestly, I felt like I had downed a bunch of Benadryl. 
I was so foggy until the raven showed up. Even now, I just really can't explain everything that I felt. When I got to the visitor center, I was the only person in the visitor center proper besides the employees, and one guy was just leaving as I entered. In the gift shop, I was getting a mug. I get a mug from each park I visit and was talking to the park ranger and the cashier who was an older American Indian woman about how awesome that the park was and how I wished that I had learned more about these cultures in school, etc. when I told them about the piece of pottery. I also said something like, Oh yeah, up at the far view sites, there's a dead animal too. When the wind dies down, you can smell it. And the park ranger and the cashier quickly looked at each other and then back to me. The cashier asked me if the smell had come before the piece of pottery, and I said yeah, that the wind had stopped and that the animals were all quiet, and I basically told them everything I said above, minus the intense urge to steal the piece of pottery, and they just looked at each other a few times and kept quiet, except when I told them about this huge raven and how it appeared. The cashier let out a gasp. When I finished my story, they had a few questions about the timing of things, how long everything lasted, and in what order everything had happened, and they asked me to describe the pottery and stuff, and all of a sudden the cashier said, would you like some tea? I love tea and was like, yeah, actually that sounds wonderful, thank you, and she went and got some. The ranger and I walked back towards the employee break room down the hall past the artifact restoration exhibit and she asked where I was and what I knew about the area. And I told her about how truly minimal my knowledge was about the native cultures, even those closer to my Midwestern home. When the cashier returned, she handed me a cup of sage tea and she asked if I was honest about what had happened. I was really confused and said, yeah, and she told me to drink. The tea kind of tasted like a no-salt vegetable stock. I wished then that I had had some honey and lemon. Then they told me about what they think that I had been near. Apparently they hear a few different stories concerning skinwalker activity throughout the year, but none where someone sees the raven, and that's why they're telling me this. The cashier proceeded to tell me a bit about skinwalkers and how sometimes they curse objects to lure unsuspecting people in. She also said that the fact that the raven had appeared and removed whatever enchantments that I felt was very important, that someone greater than us was watching out for me at that moment, because even though skinwalkers can choose many different animal forms, they would never appear as a raven due to the spiritual importance of these birds. She said that if the raven appeared to me, they could share certain information with me that they would never share with anyone. She told me that the sage would help cleanse me of any remnants of the skinwalker's tricks, and suggested that I see a shaman. I had already finished the cup of tea and was getting a little freaked out, but oddly felt more calm after hearing her speak, and I thanked them and left. I tried not to run to my car, but walked very quickly and got out of there. That night, and a night or two later, I had some very vivid dreams, but I can't remember anything of them, which is odd. I usually remember my dreams when I wake up, at least long enough to write them down. But these dreams, even though they woke me up, I couldn't recall them. I don't really know what happened, or if they were just pulling my leg. But once I got home and really started looking into these things, I kind of feel... I don't know... I feel like I'm crazy because I can't rationalize what happened. Even when writing this, I realize how insane it all sounds and I still can't even fully describe it. How weird everything got. It's just hard to put it into words. While I was growing up, around the age of three until six or seven, I had an invisible friend. He would only show up every once in a while. I thought maybe he was lonely and also needed a friend. I disliked the feeling of someone not having a friend when I was little, so I gently worked hard to be his friend, just so that he would have someone. Usually, he would appear whenever my stepmom would be mean to us and we were left alone for a bit afterward, or when I was scared or was having a paranormal experience which at the time I didn't understand. 
My teacher was fond of me and told my dad that I was special and could grow into either a very bad or a very good person. While the other kids would play on the playground together, I would sit on the hill and just enjoy the grass and trees and wind, and my teacher would sit down next to me, enjoying it in silence as well. I remember one time the other kids were on the playground and, without being told to, stopped playing and sat down with us, and we all just sat on the hill enjoying the breeze. It was a pretty nice memory, just all of us enjoying the silence and having a moment, until the school bell rang. My dad didn't think that the little boy was fake, while my stepmom tried to get me to see a specialist. My dad did eventually take me to a specialist in order to make my stepmom happy because they constantly argued about it. I remember that at our last appointment I was in the waiting room. My dad opened the door and went into her office, and I remember as my dad's back was turned to me that the specialist concluded that nothing was wrong with me, that I was just a normal kid. My dad said something along the lines of, I thought so, thank you, and he took me out for ice cream afterward. My dad later opened up to me after his divorce and said that in every generation some of the kids have gifts and that some people don't like what they can't understand, and that's why he thought my old friend wasn't made up. To this day, I don't know if he was a ghost or an invisible friend I made up as a little girl, but I do remember that he had his own personality that I was not in control of. He never really talked about anything like about his life, even if I asked him questions. He just wanted to play or he would show up and say, it's going to be okay. I remember after a while, as my stepmom hated it more and more, he sort of slowly went away. Sometimes I would call out for him, which I didn't do before, and he wouldn't show up. Sometimes when I would cry, I would sort of wait for him, hoping a little bit that he would show up. But he never did. I eventually forgot about the little boy until one day in middle school. It felt like something which was not very good was in my bedroom with me that night. The house was oddly quiet. I figured I was being silly, so I fell asleep. That night, I had a dream that I was inside of a broken-down city as a girl again. It was a misty night with puddles on the road. I could even feel the rain falling lightly on my skin. I remember that my hair was wet. The city seemed to be empty. The street lights looked old, and there weren't any lights on anywhere. Many of the building's windows were broken. Inside of the rooms were dusty and unkept. I also noticed that there wasn't any furniture inside of them or lights or doors. It was just rooms. I called out, and my voice kind of echoed as the rain tapped the ground. I noticed rather quickly that I wasn't alone. Something heard me. As a figure of something slowly crept in the distance on the street behind me, I looked closer, but it wasn't a person. I heard a loud screech, and I instantly started to run as fast as I could in the opposite direction. Whatever was inhabiting that city wasn't expecting me. Suddenly I was being chased by a bunch of shadowy, semi-human looking things. They ran fast and would jump from the wall of one building to another building, clinging onto the sides, the bricks falling and hitting the streets and the sidewalks behind me. They nearly caught up to me until I turned the corner and started to run over to an old wooden fence on the outskirts of the city. I felt the water on the grass, and I think I slipped at least once. I saw the little boy on the other side of the dark, brown, worn-down fence, and he said, Take my hand. I did, and as we ran away through an open field in an attempt to reach some woods on the other side, those things were moments away from catching us. Their claws dug into the ground. Some of the speckles of dirt flew past my face. Then I woke up. On my ceiling above my bed, there was a huge man in armor and medium-length brown hair. His hair moved, and little parts of his clothes moved with it. 
as if they were submerged. But it didn't look to me like he had been near water. He had a silk cloth. It was either red or purple. The only way I remember it is because part of it had floated steady near his hair and face. Light seemed to emit not only from his body but from underneath his skin as well. As I looked at his face, he had an expression of warmth and calm, and it felt like we knew each other. He seemed so familiar. Only the area from the top of his head until about his waist or a little below it could fit within the space of my ceiling. I remember his eyes. It was like he were trying to tell me something, that he was the little boy the entire time, and it was going to be okay. The only way that I can describe the feeling of familiarity I had is... You know the feeling when you see someone after a while, and you realize you knew each other when you were kids? Eventually, after what felt like a longer time than what it probably was, the man faded away. And it was just me in my empty room. That morning when I went upstairs to fix myself some breakfast, my uncle was talking in the living room about having a dream. I didn't really catch what his dream was about, though, until he mentioned that he woke up in the middle of the night when he heard aggressive scratching and banging on his door. My dad didn't believe him, so he brought my dad and my sister and I downstairs to show us that it was true, to show my dad that he wasn't making it up. There were long, deep scratches on the other side of his bedroom door from the hallway. I can't explain what happened, or what had made those scratch marks. I usually don't open up about my experiences. I honestly haven't had the courage to until a few days ago. Rarely have I shared them. I still haven't told my family about my dream, or the man I had seen either, but they still talk about the scratches. I'm 30 now. When I was in my teens and early 20s, I was into really weird stuff. There's a few local shops that sell unusual oddities and antiques in my town. Like art made from dead animals, skulls, pickled specimens, things like that. I started pickling my own specimens around age 20, when I figured out that it wasn't that hard. I had some articulated skeletons, but stuff that I was really interested with supposedly cursed stuff. I bought things people claimed were cursed on eBay, and even drove to different states to buy things from people that they claimed were haunted. I bought three different dye buck boxes supposedly cursed from eBay. I bought numerous haunted dolls, whatever I could find. I had some weird taxidermy items too, like a couple two-headed baby chickens, a two-headed snake, Stuff like that. I had a few things that I wasn't supposed to have either, but I won't get into that. Long story short, nothing weird ever happened. Not a thing. I never had one unusual, creepy experience with any of this stuff. I should start this off by saying I've never really believed in the paranormal or supernatural. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm a skeptic, because I think to use that term you have to go into something deciding that it isn't real and operate from that perspective. I'm fine with saying I have no idea what it is and I can't explain it. I won't say that I don't believe in ghosts, because I really don't know what a ghost is or what it's supposed to be. I've always been into aliens and was really obsessed with them when I was younger, but still never fully believed in them. I just kind of liked the idea of them. I'd never seen one, or seen any real proof of one, despite poring over documentary and late-night history channel binges. So, on the subject of all things paranormal, you might could say that I'm a fox molder and that I want to believe, but never really did. Anyway, needless to say, after the following series of events, my mind is quite a bit more open. Though I won't pretend that I can tell you exactly what was going on. So I'm around 21 years old and I'm working at Walmart at the time. We had these steps that we would smoke on that were outside the tire shop that would lead up to another parking lot for a different building. 
I went out to smoke one day and was by myself and sat at the top of the stairs. As I was smoking, I noticed a paper bag sitting kind of underneath the bushes that were there. I don't know why, but I looked in it. I was expecting to find some empty beer bottles or something, but inside of the bag was a porcelain lamb. It wasn't particularly creepy looking, to be honest. It didn't have bleeding eyes or whatever. It just looked like something that would be on your grandma's shelf. There was a red ribbon around its neck, and it looked really new. When I picked it up, there was a note underneath it in the bag. The note said, Take me home. I'll be a good little bitch, I promise. I'm not even kidding. It really said that. It was written in red ink and looked like female handwriting. Really neat. It was written on a piece of torn out standard notebook paper. I know how stupid and cliche that it sounds, but that really is what it said. Of course, being me, I brought the thing inside Walmart and stashed it under a register because I was totally going to take that home. I showed it to my friend who was working there and was kind of like, dude, look what I just found outside. Look at this note. And he was like, uh, you should definitely not take that home. But of course I was going to take it home. I lived for that kind of thing. Anyway, as soon as I set it down, I realized that it was actually a music box because I jarred it enough, I guess, to make it start playing. I looked at the bottom of it and it had one of those metal twist pins that you wind up and it plays a tune. I turned it and it was the least intimidating melody ever. It wasn't creepy at all. I was actually getting legit disappointed because if you wanted to pull a prank on someone with some scary object, this thing was doing it all wrong. I'm not sure what the melody was. I'd never heard it before, but it was in no way ominous. Fast forward to the end of the workday. I get in my car, come home, and show my then-girlfriend. She was into all the same weird things that I was, so she was equally excited about this bizarre discovery. We cleared a space on our dresser for it, and from then on we just referred to it as The Lamb. Things started happening immediately, like the next day. Me and my ex didn't have a great relationship, and I spent most of my time in the living room while she hung out in the bedroom. I'd work until around 11 at night and get home and stay on my computer playing games until around 3 a.m. Then, once she was asleep, I'd go in the bedroom and go to sleep myself. This way, we didn't really have to spend that much time together, and we both quietly preferred it that way. So, the very next day, I'm sitting in the living room and I hear a rustling sound coming from the kitchen. I could see the entire kitchen from where my computer was, and I assumed that it was one of our cats messing with something, but both cats were actually on the floor staring at the kitchen just as confused as I was. The sound seemed like it was coming from the top of the fridge, and it was like it was rustling around the cereal boxes and bags of chips and such that were up there. I assumed it was a mouse because we had found one in there before and went over to the kitchen to check for it. I turned on the light, and as I walked in the kitchen, I heard the grudge noise. I've only seen the grudge once because it was one of the only films that ever actually scared me. I'm not easily frightened, and I generally don't care that much for horror movies, but something about the long, frog-like, gurgling croak sound of the grudge freaked me out when I was younger. The only similar thing that scared me recently was the screaming bear in Annihilation. Anyway, I start walking toward the fridge and I'm totally hearing the grudge noise. Just to reiterate, this is only impactful because this is literally one of the only things that I've ever been scared of, and it was coming directly from the top of the fridge where the rustling sound had been. I froze dead in place, and so did my cats. They did not want to go anywhere near that. I had no idea what to do. I was literally on the verge of passing out. So I tried to articulate this in my head and I decided that the fridge must be broken, that a fan or something in it must be grinding. I crammed that thought into my head and I sat back down in my chair and put on my headphones. I did leave the light on, I'll admit. Normally I sat in total darkness. I was really trying to convince myself that the fridge was making that sound, but I was finding it incredibly hard to do so. 
I was also in panic mode and I was thinking, what do movies and ghost shows and stuff say? Don't acknowledge that it exists. So I became the dad in every horror film and I just said, the fridge is broken. And went back to playing WoW while on the verge of jumping out of my own skin and using my headphones to drown out the noise. I actually sat there for way longer than I normally even played WoW because I was genuinely terrified to either move or take my headphones off. I had this horrible thought in my head that as soon as I removed my headphones, I would hear the noise like right next to my ear and turn and some old woman would eat my face or something. I had no idea how long it went on or when it stopped. I literally sat there until sunrise. I never went to sleep and I used an Elvis playlist and chatting to my guildmates in WoW to distract me as best as I could but I literally just sat there frozen in terror the entire night until the sun came up and my girlfriend woke up. She came in the living room around 8 a.m. and was pissed off at me because I never went to bed. She complained that I played games too much, even though we both knew she didn't want me around any more than I wanted to be around her. But our relationship issues aside, she was badgering me about being on the computer all night and I just said, I don't want to talk about it. And she let it go. She softened up quite a bit, looked a little confused, but I think that she could tell I was freaked out. Then, she proceeded to freak me out even further. She showed me her arm and said the cat scratched the hell out of me last night, and she did indeed have what appeared to be a cat scratch running down the length of her forearm. The problem was, she kept the bedroom door closed, and like I said, both of the cats were in the living room with me, and I hadn't moved from that chair. No one let the cat in the bedroom. In fact, when sunrise came, they were still almost in the exact same spot staring at the kitchen that they had been in when I went back to playing WoW. I didn't say anything about it. I just said, oh, dang, and I felt like I was going to be sick. Since I hadn't slept, I called into work that day, even though in reality I really just wanted to leave. So I did an unusual thing, and me and my girlfriend went bowling for the day, then to a movie, then dinner. I was clearly acting weird because we never did anything together, and I was obviously trying to avoid the house. I asked if she wanted to go night fishing, and she finally asked me what the hell was going on. I didn't tell her, though. I didn't want to talk about it. She declined my generous offer to fish in the dark, and we ended up going home. We started our nightly ritual. She retired to the bedroom to watch TV, and I stayed in the living room. The grudge noise started within an hour of me sitting down. This time, as soon as it started, I willed my completely stiff in fear body to get up and walk down the hall to the bathroom. I left my computer running and wow open, and said I felt like watching TV. My girlfriend again remarked that I was acting weird, and I again declined to talk about it. I couldn't hear the grudge noise from the bedroom. I took some Benadryl and went to sleep when she did, which was hours before I normally went to bed. The next day I went to work, and at around 9 p.m. she called me. I was the manager of the toys department, and had a bit of leeway in using my phone, since no one really supervised me. I answered, and she was on the phone freaking out, screaming into my ear, and I could hear knocking in the background and couldn't really make out what she was saying. But finally, I made out a sentence. She was saying, There's banging. Someone's trying to get in through the walls. I left work and drove home and stayed on the phone with her the whole time, and at some point on my drive home, she left the house and started running down the street. I picked her up in her pajamas as I was driving back, and she again claimed that someone was trying to break in through the walls. She heard banging on all four walls of the bedroom. By this point, I was pretty certain I knew exactly what she was hearing, but I still didn't want to say anything about it. I wanted her to calm down, and I told her that it was just animals. I said that I had seen some squirrels going into a hole in the side of the wall and was afraid that we might have them in our walls. Of course, this was entirely made up, but it actually worked, and she did calm down. She didn't know squirrels could live in your walls, and I convinced her that this was the case, and I told her that I would call an exterminator in the morning and have them come out and check on everything. We went back to the house, much to my despair. My squirrel story had worked on her, 
but that was short-lived. The way our house was set up, we had a bathroom that was connected to our bedroom, but not by a door, just by the wall. So you had to leave our bedroom, and the bathroom was the next room on the right. So the bathroom wall and our bedroom wall were the same wall. Makes sense? Anyway, we got inside, she went to the bathroom, and immediately started screaming again. I went in there to see what she was screaming at, and it looked like a tiger had been clawing at the bedroom wall. The one connected to our wall. The wallpaper was torn off about six feet high, and there were large gashes in the drywall beneath it. Reminder, this is all about four days into having this lamb. At this point, we got in the car, and I told her about the sound I had been hearing. Her initial reaction was that we needed to get rid of the lamb, but something told me that I couldn't. She wanted to just donate it to a thrift shop or something, but I had this weird sense of unease about doing so. I felt like we couldn't just get rid of it that way. Like someone had to know what it was and want to take it from us. I can't explain why I felt that way. I just did. At this point, we did what you probably would not expect, and we actually just lived with it. Like, this went on every day. We had rules about it. The first rule was that we never talked about it in the house. We never even mentioned it. We pretended that the lamb did not even exist. It was like that episode of Family Guy where they had a giant octopus living in the house and just no one wanted to talk about it. When we had something to say about it, we would always say, let's go for a drive, and the other person would know what that meant. The clawing at the bathroom wall was getting deeper all the time. Eventually, there was a huge hole in the drywall, and it was starting to claw through the drywall that was connected to our bedroom. That was when I really started to freak out. For about a year, we lived with everything. We just ignored it and pretended like nothing was happening. Every night, I sat with the grudge noise. Things would fly off of shelves, doors would slam. Straight up paranormal activity, BS, every single day. One of the worst ones was one of our pickled specimens jars just exploded. It was a bird that we had had for a while, and the mason jar exploded on the mantel in the living room. Glass went everywhere, and it took hours to find it all. The bird itself also completely exploded, sending body parts splattering around the living room. It was hell. And I had a few friends that I would tell about it every day when I came into work. Like, they would ask for updates on what the lamb had been doing, and I would tell them whatever freaky story we had for the previous day. It was a daily occurrence at that point. But then, it got to a point where we couldn't ignore it anymore. My girlfriend was breaking up with bruises and scratches almost every day to the point that it had started looking like she was self-harming. She had a lot of piercings and tattoos, so she wasn't too troubled by the pain, but didn't really enjoy having to wash the blood out of the sheets every day. When it got too much was when I was sitting in the bathroom, browsing my phone, and I heard a female voice say, Hey, come here. So I finished my business and walked into the bedroom and said, Did you call me? And she replied with, I was really hoping that was you. This is about six months in. At this point, it started talking. Like literally speaking. It had a little girl's voice. I know again, that's so cliche and stupid sounding, but it would occasionally speak and we would hear it. We never responded to it. Everything we'd read on the subject told us to never ever respond. We'd hear it at our door at night, saying things like, Can I come in, please? Please let me in. At this point, you've probably tuned this out and chalked this up as some kind of excessively long, poorly written, creepy pasta, but I promise you, it isn't. Her whole family knew about it as well. All my friends did. Everyone knew about this thing. When we had friends come over, they would ask us about certain things that the lamb had destroyed, like, what's up with the bathroom wall? And we'd just respond by shaking our heads, and they got the message. Eventually, no one came to our place anymore. They all said that it freaked them out to be there and that they were terrified just to walk inside. Even her parents stopped coming over. Her mother wouldn't even drive down our street. 
Still, we ignored it. As best we could, anyway. Until one night, I'm sitting on my computer, and a voice right behind me says, Hey. I thought it was my girlfriend, so without turning around, I said, Yeah, what's up? And the voice responded, Nothing. Then I realized that it wasn't her voice, and I spun around, and nothing was there. I just broke the cardinal rule, and I talked to it. I shat a brick, grabbed my girlfriend, and told her what I did while we drove around in the car. She proceeded to call me an idiot for an hour and asked what we were going to do now. Finally, I decided to Google local paranormal investigators. We contacted a local agency and sent them an email with a more condensed version of everything I've just told you. They responded in a few hours and asked me to send them a picture of the lamb. That was the first time since the day we set it down that I had ever touched it again. I put it in the middle of the kitchen table, grabbed my camera, and took some pictures of it. I sent the pics away in an email and... nothing. Until this point, these people had been responding to me in a matter of hours, and now suddenly, an entire day had gone by. Then two days. In those two days, everything had escalated tenfold. The house was never quiet now. The grudge noise could be heard outside of the house, and it never stopped. Half the electronics didn't work. The TV barely worked. It would flicker on and off. The power would go on and off. The taps would start running and then close. The garbage disposal would turn on. The doors were slamming and opening non-stop. It was completely out of control, and we couldn't stay in the house anymore. Mind you, I wasn't rich. I'm living on a Walmart salary here, but we got a hotel room. I brought a laptop, and I emailed the paranormal investigators again. They replied to me this time and told me the lady who answers the emails was also their, like, medium or whatever, and that when I sent her the pictures, she locked herself in her house and has refused to come out for the past two days. They told me they were sorry, but that whatever I had was out of their league. So great, right? My house is possessed, and now it's gone apeshit because I talked to it. And the paranormal investigators don't even want to mess with it. I contemplated calling a priest or something, but I'm not religious, and I didn't know if I would have to have faith in the Lord Jesus or whatever for it to work. I contacted another paranormal investigations company in the area and sent them the same pics and basically begged them for help. This time they actually responded and were helpful, and they drove down from about two hours away just to talk to us. When they showed up at our house, nothing was happening. It was quiet, and everything looked normal. The doors were all closed, no sounds, nothing. Worse yet, they busted out all these gadgets, and I'm not going to pretend I knew what they did or what they were for. Some had lights, some made beeps, some buzzed, one made little lasers all over the house. They had recorders, microphone equipment, they saged everywhere, walked around waggling electronics at various locations. I don't know exactly what the hell they were doing, but I at least appreciated that they seemed to be trying. But they weren't getting anything. Nothing was happening. I even recorded bits of it on my own camera. Then all of a sudden, stuff did happen. My camera quit working out of nowhere. The battery just KO'd. All their noisy equipment started making noise, and something was over 9,000. There were three people and they started talking to it like, if you're here, give me a sign. And then they asked it to knock on stuff, and this went on for like two hours. Eventually, they wrapped up, and the woman who was with him said that she believed the thing who was inhabiting our lamb wasn't a spirit. She said it wasn't ever a person, and that it was something else. She said that it was pretending to be a child to try and trick us, and the fact that we weren't being tricked was angering it. They left and told me that she would call me the next day. She said she knew someone who might be willing to take it. I couldn't fathom who would want this thing, but my girlfriend and I spent the night in the hotel room again, and I did indeed get a call from the woman the next day. She said that she had spoken with someone called John Zappas, and that he was excited and wanted the item. 
I didn't know who that was at the time. She told me he was the haunted collector, but that meant absolutely nothing to me. They said he had a paranormal museum. They came back to the house, got the lamb, and mailed the thing off to him. Later, I realized that the dude had a TV show and is the nephew of Ed and Lorraine Warren. And that's basically it. Once this Zaphis dude had agreed to take it, everything stopped. We never had another weird incident happen again. I never fixed the bathroom wall, though. We moved out when we split up and left it like that for the people that we sold the house to. On a side note, I recently, like in the last six months, watched The Conjuring movies. In a very short scene, I believe, in The Conjuring 2, there's a shot of the Warren's daughter sleeping in her bed. On her nightstand is an identical lamb to the one that I had. When I saw it, I almost started crying in terror. I work in a pharmacy that's located inside a nursing home, and I've been working there for the past four years. Just a note to mention, I've had many prior paranormal experiences in my life, but this is still ongoing. I've always felt a presence since the first week that I started, but it was never anything that made me feel threatened. Things didn't really start happening until last year, when I was talking to my co-workers about feeling a presence and asking if that was something that they had experienced as well. The day after I had a conversation with my co-worker, I was working a night shift. On our night shifts, there's only one technician and a pharmacist. I was sitting at the back counter on my computer when I thought that I had seen someone come through the door. We're usually not busy at night, but there is the odd time when one of the nurses will come down for a bag of chips or a pop. I got up from where I was seated and walked over to where our cash register was, and from there you can see the pop coolers and the chip racks. I couldn't see anyone, so I left and walked back and forth, looking down the aisles. Nobody was there. I asked my coworker if he had seen anyone come in, and he said no but I was 99.9% .9 sure that someone had walked through that door. I didn't think much of it. It was late, and I decided that I was probably just tired. I sat back down in my chair and started filling prescriptions. About 25 minutes later, I looked up and saw a pack of toilet paper slowly moving forward to the edge of the shelf before it dropped on the ground, startling me. There's absolutely no way that it could have just been our air system or a draft that had knocked it off. My coworker saw this too, and also thought it was odd. I told him it was a spirit that moved it, and he looked at me like I had five heads. So, to prove my point, I brought up the security camera footage. On the video, you can see two bright and fairly large orbs moving around as the toilet paper was being moved. I showed it to him, and there was no denying that it was a spirit trying to make itself known. That was my first significant paranormal experience at the pharmacy. We've had things go missing only to find them in the strangest places. For example, my car keys went missing one day from my locker, only for me to find them in with the prescription vials. My co-workers all swore up and down that nobody had hidden them there, and I most definitely didn't. Things are always falling off of the shelves, and sometimes they're heavy items. Not just something light like the toilet paper incident. We had a 5 kilogram jug of Epsom salts crash onto the ground and break open, and no one was even remotely close to the aisle. Many of my co-workers and I see what looks like someone walking by out of the corner of our eye, only to realize that no customers are in the store. We also hear what sounds like the door to the front entrance open and close, and nobody is coming in. This happens multiple times a day, sometimes. The only time I've ever felt threatened or scared so far was when I was working the night shift and got locked in the bathroom. 
It could well have been a hardware malfunction, but I don't believe that it was. The handle locked from the inside, and I don't normally lock it anyways. I did my business, flushed the toilet, and washed my hands. I went to exit the seemingly unlocked door and felt that it was being held shut from the other side. I figured it was just my coworker messing with me, so I started yelling his name, and that it wasn't very funny, and to let me out. The handle started moving as if someone was on the other side, wiggling it. I yelled again for my coworker, and he must have finally heard me because I could hear his footsteps. He asked what was wrong, and then pulled the door open with ease. He's now finally starting to believe that I wasn't crazy, and that this place actually has some paranormal activity going on. All the guards at my workplace know this theater is haunted. We're all used to the super eerie feelings down in the lower levels, backstage areas. Most of it can be passed off as long work hour stress, but there is definitely some evil shit in this building with us. It's probably an entity that's latched itself onto themes like theatrics and whatnot. I don't know. We got all kinds of stories. We have all heard the grand piano playing on its own in the night, heard ghostly voices arguing every now and then as we walk through the halls. Sometimes I smell a harsh burning in the halls at night, like sulfur. We all know that doesn't mean well. Tonight has been the worst it's ever been. I heard a door slam shut nearby as I was patrolling, and as a joke, I yelled out, Who it be? Inside joke with me and my friends to lighten my nerves and I heard a deep, almost unintelligible male voice saying, It be me. Sounds kind of funny, but I did not enjoy that. My Bluetooth headphones blatantly refused to work tonight. I also walked through one of the function halls in the darkness. Once the building closes, we patrol without many lights on, other than the occasional safety lights here and there, and I saw something following me in the mirror. I refused to look behind me or stare at the mirror too long, but it appeared to be a figure clearly dressed in the costume of like a king with a fur robe and a black jagged crown. Its head was tilting side to side as it shuffled along behind me, kind of like a wind-up toy. It moved so soundlessly that I was pretty startled by it. I couldn't feel my legs out of dread, so I didn't even stop walking. I just stopped looking immediately, and calmly kept the same pace on my way out of the room, pretending to see nothing. I think this is happening due to the current performance of a really old and famous play called Faust. A very famous actor died performing it here in Melbourne a long time ago in another theater nearby, and is a ghost, and his ghost allegedly haunts the theater to this day. It's not far down the road from our theater. There is also a secret warehouse on the site, the location of which, for obvious reasons, we do not share with the public. But this warehouse is basically a storage room full of really old and valuable artifacts that have to do with early modern theater and music. Authentic historical pieces like 18th century instruments and old chests and trunks that belong to people of fame. One-of-a-kind tapes recorded by famous rock and blues musicians, old stage set models, some dating back all the way to the 1800s. It's crazy. I know for a fact that some of these old artifacts bring with them the presence of beings potentially even older than they are. You couldn't pay me to open some of these creepy-looking trunks. Safe to say, I'm glad I'm casual now and no longer work full-time. I've been working here for almost a year. It's hands down the most haunting place that I have ever experienced. This is by far the spookiest experience my family and I have had regarding the paranormal. 
I'm currently living in Australia, and this all started when I moved into my current house around three years ago. In my culture, we believe that whenever a family moves into a new home, a priest should come to perform various prayers to bless the house. However, when my mom bought the house, we immediately went on holiday for three months, so we were unable to perform the rituals. Everything started when we first came back home. Just some background, my mom raised me on her own, so it was just the two of us staying in the house at the time. I was still in high school, and my mom worked in the city, so we both took the train every morning. She always left home earlier than me, so it was my job to lock up each day. She also worked late almost every day, so I would get home first and be home alone for at least five hours. One morning, as I left home, I began to feel paranoid that I had not locked the door, so I walked back to check it. The door was locked. Later that day, when I came home, I walked up my driveway to find that the door was wide open. I freaked out, but was brave enough to go inside. Our kitchen is pretty close to the entrance, so I grabbed a knife and searched the entire house. There was no one there. I decided to not tell my mom because she was really stressed with work and I didn't want her to freak out too. Over the next few days, another strange thing started to happen. Our garage door would randomly open whenever we were home. My mom was kind of scared, but then we thought maybe our neighbor's garage remote functioned at the same frequency or something and it was activating our door too, so we dismissed it. It had been about two months since we were living in our new house and everything seemed to be normal again. Until one day when I was awoken in the middle of the night by my mom. She looked super scared and asked me if I had come into her room to wake her up. I said no, I was half asleep and had no idea what she was rambling on about. She didn't believe me and made me swear that I hadn't. I always play scare pranks on my family, so that was why. I swore I didn't and asked her what was up. She is a super light sleeper, and so while she was sleeping she heard someone prop her door open. She looked up and saw the figure of a boy and thought it was me. She asked it what's wrong, and blinked. There was nothing there, and her door was still open. She called my name a few times and there was no response, hence why she came to my room. I have to admit, given the stuff happening with the doors, I was kinda scared, but I convinced my mom that she was imagining things and she went back to sleep. Ever since that night, and up to this day, my mom still sleeps with her door open and the living room light on. And I do not blame her after what happened next. Two weeks after this incident occurred, my mom's best friend and her son and daughter, who were both around my age, came over from our homeland, Malaysia, to visit us. I was really excited, as I have always been close to them. One thing you should know about my aunt. She's had many experiences growing up with the paranormal, and so she is super afraid of ghosts. For this reason, me and her kids always used to play pranks on her. One day, the four of us were playing poker on the dining room table while my mom was taking a nap in the living room. Suddenly, my mom rushes out to the living room, her eyes wide open, and she looked terrified. She asked who had woken her up from her nap. The four of us were dumbfounded, as we had just been playing cards the entire time. She then told us that she felt someone tap her shoulder while she was asleep. When she opened her eyes, there were two feet on the floor. Once again, she blinked, and the feet were gone, and there was no one there. My mom was having a full-on breakdown, especially after what had happened the other night. Then my aunt, given how afraid she was of ghosts, started to melt down as well. I didn't want her holiday to be ruined, so I managed to convince them that my mom was probably in the middle of a dream, so when she woke up, she was most likely hallucinating. 
Yeah, I know, it sounds stupid, but hey, it worked. But then the next day, something else happened. My mom had gone to the shops to get groceries. The kids and I were playing video games in the living room while their mom was having a shower. Suddenly we hear the bathroom door burst open and out runs my aunt wrapped in her towel. She screamed at us, telling us to stop trying to scare her and that it wasn't funny. The three of us were extremely confused and her daughter asked her what had happened. She told us that she knew we were the ones knocking on the bathroom door, even after she told us to stop three times. I know it probably seems like she was overreacting, but again, I cannot emphasize her fear of ghosts. I exchanged a concerned look with her kids and then told her that it genuinely was not us and that we were playing FIFA the entire time. Soon my mom got home and we told her what happened also. Let's just say that my aunt started sleeping with her room lights on for the rest of her trip. Soon, she and her kids had gone home, and it was back to me and my mom again. We returned to our regular routine. My mom was finally at peace, and she hadn't seen anything for a while apart from the garage door opening on its own every now and then. The same, however, could not be said for me. It seemed that it had become my turn to be tormented. As I mentioned before, with my mom at work, I would be home alone for a few hours every day. I began to start to hear things. The strange bit is that it would never occur while I was in the living room. Whenever I went to use the toilet or went to sit in my room, I would start hearing things coming from the living room and kitchen. It started out small. Just the sound of some panting, like if you had run a marathon. That kind of panting. But the minute I entered the living room, Nothing. There would be no sound at all. It soon started to get worse. I would hear footsteps pacing around outside my room and spoons and pots falling in the kitchen. But every time I step out into the living room again, the noises would stop and everything would be just as I left it. There was even a time when I thought I heard a kid laughing right outside the door when I was in the toilet. I decided not to tell my mom again because she seemed to be getting over her experiences and I didn't want to scare her all over. But one day I felt that I needed to tell her and we decided that day that it was time we contacted our priest to perform the prayers for our house. It was the day my best friend and his parents came over for dinner. When it all began it was a completely innocent meal. My best friend and his family are Malaysian too, and we were having a great time talking about home while having a signature Malaysian dish. My friend's dad was telling us a story when all of a sudden his face just froze and his eyes widened. He honestly looked like he was having a stroke. His face contorted into a frown and he just stared down at the table. My mom and I shared a worrying look but my friend and his mom just continued eating like nothing was happening. Suddenly, his dad seemed to return to us, and he continued telling the story as if nothing had occurred. But he could see that my mom and I were visibly concerned. Suddenly, his wife tapped his shoulder and said, Just tell them. He frowned at his wife and just kept eating. There was an awkward silence for a few minutes, and then he finally decided to address the elephant in the room. He apologized for scaring us and assured us that there was no need to worry. He then went on to tell us about his life. Since he was a child, he had been very religious, and from a young age he felt a very close connection to God. He regularly meditated and was very, very spiritual. So spiritual that when he was in his mid-twenties, he had awoken with a gift. He was able to see dead people. I kid you not, when he said this, I immediately looked at my friend, waiting for him to start laughing at some prank. But my friend's face was completely serious, and he continued looking at his dad as the man told his story. 
He told us he could see them everywhere, when he was walking his dog on the street, when he's sitting in the park, in people's houses, and even sometimes sitting on people who had been possessed. He said the spirits were drawn to him because they knew that he could see them, and they would stalk him, begging him to help them reach the afterlife. He said there was simply nothing he could do because these people had died before their time, and they would simply have to wait on Earth until it was their time. Back home, he was regularly contacted by people having paranormal experiences to perform a cleansing or drive evil spirits away. He told us about some of those experiences, but I don't feel like it's my place to share them here. He then asked us something that gave me chills. Have you guys performed prayers for your house yet? My mom refused to answer the question until he told her why he had asked it. He said that he didn't want to worry us, but that if we hadn't, we probably should. My mom continued to ask him why until he finally conceded. This is what he said. Remember when I had that moment just now while I was talking? I had a visit. I won't tell you what it was, but it was the same spirit that I saw standing at the front door when we came in here. That's when my mom told him everything that had been happening. It was during this time that I also decided to tell my mom about the things that I had been hearing in the house. My friend's dad then told us that he did not think it was a malicious spirit, but to be safe, and that it was time for us to conduct the prayers. Before he left, he asked my mom if he could see our altar in the prayer room. My mom took him to it and we all followed. As he stood in front of the altar, his whole body shook, as if he just had a huge hiccup. He then put his hands together and bowed his head. Before leaving, he said, I can see why the two of you have not been hurt. You're protected. That concluded our visit. A week later, we arranged for a priest from our local temple to cleanse and bless our home. I promise you that ever since that day, nothing strange has ever happened in our house. Even the garage door has stopped opening on its own. I'm not a particularly religious person, but I have learned my lesson. I will never move into a house without performing the rituals that my culture demands. I was 13 years old, 2003. My friend and I were bored and decided to have some weird fun. Now, I've always had interest in supernatural and occult-like things. I've always been very empathic and in tune to things in a way that's hard to explain. Anyways, I didn't have a real Ouija, so we used paper and drew one and then used a corridor for the planchette. We asked if anyone was there and if they wanted to talk. Of course, there was nothing for a few minutes. Suddenly, the feathers of my dream catcher in my room started to sway. No open window or AC on. We asked again if anyone was there, and then it felt like there was a pull. We allowed ourselves to let go and just see what happened. It went to the yes. We asked what its name was, and we felt pulled towards D and C. Just those letters, D, C. Odd. A minute or so later, my grandma called for us that she was ready to go, as we were about to go to the mall. We stood up and walked out of my room. My friend looked at my face and gasped, and told me to look in the mirror. I had about a two-inch scratch on my face that was not there before. We were a little freaked out, but mostly confused. We went shopping and my grandma asked what had happened, and I told her I really didn't know. The next morning, the scratch was gone. After that night, however, things got pretty bad. My room for some reason started to feel colder than the rest of the house. Even my grandma commented a few weeks later that my room was, quote-unquote, cold as death. My dog stopped coming into my room as well. 
He would stand at the doorway and I would call for him and he would just look at me and leave. He might come in rarely for a minute or so, but he would never stay. I started to get feelings like I wasn't alone. The air felt thicker, the dark seemed darker. When I was home alone, I would hear things. Footsteps and creaking. One night, it all came to a head. My grandparents went out to dinner and I stayed home. I was downstairs playing on the desktop and instant messaging my friend. The bathroom door next to me had been shut tight, but made a clicking sound. The knob had turned and the door had opened slowly. I got up and slammed it shut. I went back to playing my game and instant messaging when I heard a loud crash. I got up and saw my grandparents' crucifix that had been hanging on the wall, on the floor. I put it back and turned on as many lights as I could, and the TV, and just took my mind off it all. Around this time, my grandma, who is very Catholic, started getting into more New Age things like crystals and psychics. She went to one and the psychic told my grandma that she had a granddaughter who saw orbs, but that these orbs I had been seeing were angels protecting me. It is true that I had been seeing a lot of flashing lights that I called orbs in those months. Fast forward a year or so, and some things happened to me that I won't go into here. Depression and hospitalizations and boarding schools. When I got home from boarding school, my grandma told me that she had spent a night in my room. She had laid down to go to sleep and suddenly heard a cranking noise. She said she remembers thinking to herself, please don't start playing music. And then my music box started playing. She said she bought a lot of different incense and played a special prayer on repeat for days and basically prayer bombed the whole house. When I returned home, my room felt clean, like whatever had been there was gone. Safe. I stopped seeing the orbs as much. I never played with a Ouija board again, but I do love the designs. I have a Ouija board mug and a Ouija board mat on my dresser. I like the symbol and I'm not afraid of them, but I will never use one again. I have been tempted through the years to try again, hoping that maybe being better prepared I can have a safer outcome, but I just don't know if I want to take that chance of opening a door to any stranger knocking. I have a story from about two years ago that really captivates me to this day. When I've told this story to close friends, they tell me it's straight out of a movie. I can't really disagree with that. This starts when I finished my first year of college in the Bay Area. I worked my ass off in school and I just wanted to have a wild summer and I would do anything I could to get out of the house. My cousin was and is my best friend, and we basically did anything and everything together. When there wasn't anything to do, we'd take walks together around my rural neighborhood. I always lived near this old hospital, which used to operate as the biggest trauma unit in my area. Sometime when I was in high school, they shut the hospital down for some reason that I still don't know. It basically just sat there rotting for a few years before we found it. One day, we were drinking a cold one and taking one of our routine walks and ventured away from our usual route through this peaceful, random field. We stumbled across this huge parking lot after making it out of the field, but it didn't hit me that this was the old hospital's parking lot that we had found. We made our way through the lot until we saw this massive building standing on the outside. The deteriorated banner said emergency room. And this was when we knew we had struck gold and stumbled across a back route to this abandoned hospital. We knew of this place, but we had never been here. We hadn't heard any weird, outlandish urban legends, nor had anyone that we knew been here before us. We pushed forward and checked out the perimeter. To our surprise, the first door we walked up to had a rock jammed in between the door frames so that we could just waltz right in. 
This was when it occurred to us that it could be a potentially bad idea if we got caught and we could suffer some consequences. We agreed we would be quiet and respectful and make it a quick trip. This is where things take a turn. Or a few turns. We entered the building and it was the most deafening quiet that I had ever experienced. The sound of the door closing was like a literal bomb going off. Once the echo stopped from the door, it dawned on us that this place was straight up creepy. We walked slowly, but the floor is covered in glass, which makes even the smallest of steps sound like Bigfoot lumbering around a library. We found a patient room, which still had a bed inside. We stopped at the doorway to look in, because the floor looked sketchy. Out of nowhere, from around the corner, we heard the faintest, slow, drawn-out whistling. I've never in my life stopped what I was doing so suddenly. I just stared wide-eyed at my cousin, because even a whisper sounds like yelling in this place. We both have our feet planted to the ground, because if we move, then we too will make ourselves known. At this point, we both assumed there could potentially be a squatter or a guard of some sort. My cousin hand gestures to me that we have to leave and we can't just stand here because the whistling was obviously not going to stop. We turn toward the opposite of the corner that the whistling is at, and we're tiptoeing to a perfect science. Then, the whistling stopped. We freeze again, and we hear the glass crunching from around the corner. We start running. Once we get to the door we came from, we realize we didn't put a fucking rock in the door frame when we came in, and now the door is completely stuck. As we were trying to get this door open, the glass crunching is now running. We hear it until it sounds like it is dangerously close. I am horrified. We turn around to try another door, and the noise of the glass is literally right in front of us. Yet no one is there. No one. We book it to a door that says pharmacy and peel the door open. The pharmacy is completely empty except a single, perfectly placed and aligned landline phone plugged into the wall. The phone is off the hook and making a dial tone. The whole thing is so perfectly lined up and centered with the whole room, I've never seen anything like it and the dial tone was so loud in such an empty place. There wasn't power throughout the hospital, so how was it working? I was in complete shock. We left and never went back. I had heard of some other kids going there at night. They told me that they also heard the whistling and thought someone was lurking in the shadows the whole time. It is a freaky world out there. I've worked three and a half years now as a psych tech at a unit that covers the southeast portion of my state. The unit I work on you can think of as the ER for psych. We admit individuals who are having mental breaks or who need help for self-harm, being disabled from their psych disorder, or harming others. The unit is freaking old, and has been around since the time of Moses it seems. Even though weird events go on, it's a pretty awesome job helping others, and I love working here while I finish going to school. I will say to start out with, that most nights on the unit are really quite boring. Naturally, with the type of individuals that can stay here, the unit can have a change in its feeling rather quickly, though. I've had individuals who I've never met before know strange things about me or other patients, such as where I've buried my dogs, names of family members, or the streets that I've grown up on. You'll get a weird vibe walking by certain patients. At times, my patients will say creepy stuff, such as being told the devil has sent its demons to watch me and not mess up. I witnessed a lady who came in for suicidal thoughts slowly progress to sitting in a corner and screaming no stop till she couldn't talk. This lady shouted and shrieked the same phrases over and over in an empty room. 
The unit also has one room that I dislike, because no matter who gets assigned to stay in that room, they always seem to get much worse before they get better. The room is always cold, even when the heat comes through the vent. I can recall four patients asking to switch rooms because the shadows in the room surround them when they sleep and buzz at them at night. My most recent experience was while doing my safety check in an unoccupied room which had the door open. Previously in the shift I knew it was locked because I had checked all the unused rooms to make sure that they were indeed closed and locked. I thought housekeeping had come up to clean the room, possibly, since a patient was discharged from in there the night before. Next thing I knew, I had a soap bar and a shampoo bottle thrown at me. It wasn't a joke throw either, but a rip right at me. The door slammed shut. I think a patient is in there now. I open the door to a completely empty, clean room. I lock it up pick up the soaps, and try to tell the other tech that I'm working with what had happened. We pull up the camera and sure enough you can watch that event unfold in the hall. Not all experiences are bad or evil on the unit. The patients will sometimes tell me that they had family that's passed on stay the night in their room and visit with them until they fall asleep. Another time I had one patient tell me that a giant white figure stood guard by their door and kept the shadow figures from coming in until they were finally able to doze off. We do have regular figures that walk the yard and hang out in the rooms. One we call the engineer because the figure is always being seen in the utility closet. The mysterious stranger resembles a character out of a game. He's a tall guy in a tannish trench coat and business hat walking the same path around three in the morning and disappears after he passes by a big elm tree. Before you come onto the unit, there's a fairly large gym to play basketball, lift weights, or exercise, which low-risk patients can use with a staff member. Before you come onto the unit, there's a fairly large gym to play basketball, lift weights, or exercise, which low-risk patients can use with a staff member. On my fourth meal break, I usually eat and do a little working out. The gym also has a radio to hook up your phone to and to jam some music. This particular time, I'm shooting hoops and listening to Metallica. My break ends, so I put the ball away and unplug my phone to leave. As the music cuts, I hear a soft voice say, keep playing. Similar story from a coworker from the same place. When she turned the music off, she heard someone picking up singing where the song had stopped. Apparently, they also enjoy music just as much as the rest of us. Here is the chilling tale of one of my stepmoms, who will call Lisa here experiences with ghosts that she has conjured through her old Ouija board. So Lisa had just divorced her ex-husband and was living alone in a new house with her two kids. She moved to get away from the torturous spirits or demons in her old house. She was settling down with a broken heart and a new life. She went to bed after forgetting to pray one night she did this because it was what the priest told her to do to solve her problems with the paranormal. It seemed to work, she told me. But when I didn't do it, it would all come back. Lisa had no paranormal experiences while she was in that house. Until now. On the night, she didn't pray. Her oldest kid was seven and now sleeping alone. Her youngest was three, and Lisa kept her sleeping in her room because she felt like she had to keep an eye on her. Because of all the experiences, she was a worrywart. Anyway, she falls asleep and wakes up to three knocks. She knows this all too well. She lit a sage, prayed, and went back to sleep. This didn't work. That night, she kept hearing scratches on her wall above her head. She turns to look up and sees a face in the pitch black dark. Lisa just woke up and thought it was her imagination. But then came a feeling of impending doom. 
a feeling also that she knew too well. She turns on her lamp, turns around to see a black mist looming next to her bed. She grabs her daughter who is sleeping with her and grabs a Bible. She screams for the mist to go away and everything calms down. She flicks on the light, paces around the room and looks over to where she heard the scratching sounds earlier. To her horror, she sees three scratch marks the size of tiger claws above her bed on the wall. The scratches were on her wall until she put up new wallpaper. I asked her stepdaughters. One of them remembers her mom screaming at a wall. She never saw what my stepmom saw, but they wondered why they saw the scratch marks. So before some of y'all say I'm making this up, it's not my responsibility to prove it. So a couple of years ago, I want to say like two or three, me and my friend were bored. This was around the time that the Ouija board trend was going around on YouTube, and that kind of stuff has always, and still does, fascinate me. So we both decided to make a Ouija board out of a rectangle of cardboard that we cut off of a box. I believe we also made a ghetto-looking planchette out of cardboard too, with a hole cut out of the middle and everything. So anyways, we brought the thing into the basement of my house. Already a huge mistake, as I learned after and we started messing around and using it. I don't even remember what we asked it or anything that really happened in detail, but I do remember being in such shock because I felt a strong connection, almost like a magnetic pull, pulling it down and moving it from underneath. Another thing that we both admitted to feeling after we played with it for a couple of minutes was a cold chill, only on our arms, that we were playing with. It wasn't really a breeze, but it just felt, well, bone chilling. The point of this story comes into play now. That night I was in my bedroom, and I got up to go to the washroom, which is straight across the hall from my room, to brush my teeth and get ready for bed. I left my phone on my bed before leaving. So after I was done getting ready and all, I opened the bathroom door and immediately noticed that my room's lights were turned off. This threw up a red flag in my mind right away, and while I was scared, I just thought it was nothing and flipped the lights in my room back on. I went to grab my phone to distract me from the adrenaline and try to calm me down before bed, and I didn't see it on my bed. Or anywhere, for that matter. I got creeped out and immediately flipped the lights off and jumped into bed and hid under the covers. I tried to fall asleep even though the thought that the Ouija board we had used earlier that day was in the closet about five feet away from me would not leave me alone. I swear I heard a faint knock from inside my closet multiple times that night, but maybe it was just my mind messing with me. The next morning I wasn't as scared or freaked out as I was the night before, and I got up to take a shower. Once I got out of the shower and stepped out of the bathroom, my phone was right there, on the floor, right in front of me. To this day, it still troubles me, and I have no idea what happened that night. I haven't touched the cardboard Ouija again, but I did purchase a legit Ouija board like three months later, and have not really had any outstanding experiences with it like I had with the cardboard one. I work for a nonprofit that helps mentally and physically disabled people live fulfilling lives. J and C are brothers. I work for the same company as C, but at a different house. There are several houses around the city and bordering area. He works at the houses that only house children, four of them I believe. 
His story begins on a graveyard shift which he was working with one co-worker, a middle-aged woman. The house has alarms on the doors and windows which are alarmed during the night to let them know if any kids try to leave when they shouldn't. C was downstairs in the office. His co-worker was upstairs cleaning. Suddenly, the alarms in the house went off, every door and window. He sprang up, assuming that the clients were planning some mass breakout, as he would later refer to it. He yelled up to his co-worker to head out one door. He went out the other, frantically looking for whoever was outside. He saw one client standing beneath a tree, but apparently not in any hurry. He thought he recognized the client to be someone we'll call B. He said, B, head back inside, or something to that effect. He continued searching for the other clients, but after running around in a panic, found no one. He gave up and headed inside to reconvene with his coworker. He said he found B, but no one else. She stunned him when she revealed that everyone was inside, never having left, including B. He said she must be mistaken. He was just outside beneath a big tree in the backyard. She had fear on her face when he insisted this. She explained how what he saw was in fact what staff of that house referred to as white dress. A ghostly woman wearing all white that seems to reside on the property and is often seen under that tree. Needless to say, he was surprised and confused and definitely creeped out. But the story doesn't end there. Some time later, a client from another home whom C was very close to sadly died. He was sick for a while, and C was present for his final breaths in the hospital. He was wheelchair-bound when he was alive, and later a client at the white dress home needed a wheelchair temporarily while recovering from a slip-and-fall accident. They brought the wheelchair that used to belong to K. Right away, B began fixating on it. When it was no longer in use, B would take it for his own enjoyment. Staff took note of this and couldn't explain why he loved it so much. He would take it outside to a small hill, push it down the hill empty, and then return it to the top and do it again, over and over. B is nonverbal in that he can't speak with spoken language, but he does understand speech and communicates using gestures. One useful gesture has him select staff's right or left hand in a sort of this or that conversation. For example, I could hold out my hand and say, B, do you want tacos for dinner? Identify it as my left hand option. Or do you want burgers for dinner? Right hand. And then he would choose. He also had a tick where he would hold his palm up to his face very close and sort of mumble into it. This is actually what C thought he saw when white dress was under the tree. He thought B was there, and that he was doing that. This is important because B would often do this gesture when he played with the wheelchair. Staff got curious and thought that they might be able to determine who B was talking to and playing with in the wheelchair. They posed a sequence of this or that questions with fake names. B, who's in the wheelchair? Is it Michael or Emily? No response. Is it James or Samuel? No response. Is it Stephanie or Teresa? Again, no response. They did this a few times before inserting the real name. Is it Kay or Jen? Right away, he selected the correct hand. Everyone present was shocked. According to C, he was the only real link between Kay and this house. B and Kay didn't know each other and he didn't believe anyone talked of the previous owner of the wheelchair, so he can't explain how B seemingly knew Kay's name. The story still doesn't end there, however. For reasons unknown to me, C took the wheelchair home for a while. Maybe it was a keepsake. Regardless, he brought it home with him and weird things started happening around his house. C and J, like I said, are brothers. They live in a big house and rent it out with their girlfriends as well as two others. One day, everyone was out except for J as well as C's girlfriend. Both of them claimed that the door to C's room slammed much too loudly and hard to be explained by wind, especially since no windows in his bedroom were open. This happened a few times while the wheelchair was there, which is made more interesting when you know that Kay would often get C's attention by slamming doors. 
Jay said other strange things had happened once the wheelchair arrived, too, but I'm not sure what they were and don't want to confabulate the details. I do know that he claimed to once hear someone calling out his name, but no one was home except him. As I said in the opening of this post, both J and C were and still remain skeptics. They agree that these events are all strange, but ultimately they aren't convinced. I too am what I call a hopeful skeptic. I would love for any sort of paranormal subjects in the world to be verified, but I guess I just need to see it myself to believe it. I was a jail nurse for about three years in a correctional facility that housed approximately 1,300 inmates. Loved the job, would have stayed longer, but administration sucked. Anyhow, that's another story. I worked night shift, and I've had some really creepy things happen that just could not be rationally explained. I worked both booking and infirmary, but the majority of the incidents occurred in the infirmary. Okay, so I was there maybe a month. Not a new nurse, but new to corrections. Anyone who has spent any time in a jail will tell you that when those heavy doors slam shut, it is a very distinctive, definitive, loud noise. To get into the infirmary, you have to have a key or be buzzed in by a central control. So I'm sitting at my desk, and I hear the metal door outside my office click like someone from Central has unlocked it, and it opens about halfway, and then just slammed shut. Now in my office, there is a huge glass window so that the nursing staff can see any inmates that are about to enter. When the door slammed, I thought it was just one of the officers messing around, and I jumped up and went to the window, but no one was there. I called Central, and the officer that answered sounded like I just woke him from a sound sleep, and I said, Ha ha, very funny. He had no idea what I was talking about. And I knew this officer, and I was surprised that he would go along with any type of prank, because frankly, he was kind of a jerk-off with absolutely no sense of humor. After that, I just thought it was some mechanical glitch. I sat down, and everything just... changed. It felt colder, and I sensed that I was being watched. I was just all around uncomfortable. I took my stethoscope from around my neck and put it on the desk and left my office to go into the medical department. I stayed in medical for a few talking to the staff in there and then went back to my office. When I walked in, I went to grab my stethoscope off the desk to check an inmate and it wasn't there. I looked on the desk, on the side, underneath. It just wasn't there. I should mention that when I left my office, I did lock the door as per protocol, and I'm the only one on the shift with the key. Now I think I'm going crazy, so I start looking everywhere, and I cannot find it. In my office, there is a large closet that holds all supplies that is also locked, with the key being on the set of keys that I carry. Anyhow, later in the shift, I needed to go into the closet and get something. I really don't remember what. And sitting in the middle of the floor is my stethoscope. I picked it up, and the heavy metal door outside my office clicks again, opens halfway, and slams shut. I locked the closet, locked my office, and went out for a smoke. I was scared shitless, but I had responsibilities and patients to look after. So I go back in, and I swear, the whole atmosphere was lighter. It was warmer, and I felt way more comfortable. When my shift was over, the central officers rewound the tapes for me, and I saw the doors just open and slam shut with not a single person near them or in the hallway. I wish I could say that that was the last time it happened, or that I got more comfortable with it. I did not, because each time it happened, it seems that the door slammed harder, and that uncomfortable feeling lasted longer and longer, almost as if I were being stalked. Things that went missing were found in different parts in the jail. My pen case in the women's wing, my med sheets in solitary central control room, my portable blood pressure cuff in the kitchen, 
And each and every time something of mine would show up in another part of the jail, the officers and I would look at the tapes and see no one. Remember, I said I felt like I was being stalked. Well, that's because all these things happened to me, but no other nurse who worked nights. Not one other nurse who worked on my days off had anything happen either. No doors slam, click open, shut, no stuff moving. It was just me. Every officer and every one of the medical staff who worked there well before I got there swore up and down that this kind of incident never, ever had occurred before. It got to the point for me that I started just not staying in my office. I would just get all the stuff that I needed for my shift and sit at the officer's desk. I did that until I left there and got another job. I haven't had anything like that happen ever again. My late mother told me her ghost stories from a time when she worked as a charge nurse at a well-known hospital in my state. Please forgive me if the story is hard to follow, as she told me this when I was a kid. In the early 90s, my mother was fresh out of medical school and was fortunate enough to find a job at a prestigious hospital. The only downside of taking this job was the fact that she would be working the graveyard shift. A typical hospital night shift is 11 p.m. to 7 a.m. A couple of months into the job, she found out that one of her good friends from medical school had gotten a job at the same hospital as her. Unfortunately for my mother, her friend had gotten a day shift. On this particular day, my mother's friend ran into some car trouble and couldn't get a ride home. My mom, being the helpful person that she was, told her friend that she could pick her up and take her home before her shift started. My mom picked her friend up and took her home. Her friend was thankful for my mother and insisted that she stay and eat some dinner. My mother couldn't turn down the offer as she had rushed out of the house to go and pick up her friend in the first place. My mom and her friend sat at the dining room table eating dinner. In front of the table in the family room was a large fish tank. Looking at the tank, my mother noticed that all of the fish were pressed up against one side of it. She wasn't really bothered by this, but asked her friend, Did you forget to feed your fish today? Why? All your fish are out and pressed against one side of the tank. My mother's friend looked at the tank and laughed. Maybe it's my uncle. The fish would do that when he would look through one end of the glass. I thought you mentioned to me that your uncle had passed away when you were in medical school? Yeah, sometimes I think he's just standing there looking at the fish, or maybe I'm losing it. They both laughed it off and finished dinner. My mother thanked her friend for dinner and left to make it to work on time. My mother was less than a mile away from work when she saw blue lights in her rearview mirror. She thought to herself, was I speeding? Did I forget to signal? Did I accidentally run a stop sign? All of this ran through her mind as she pulled over. The police officer came out to the car and up to the driver's side window. He shined the flashlight in my mother's eyes and asked for her license and registration. And then, the usual, do you know why I pulled you over tonight? No, sir. Well, the person in the passenger seat is jumping around and clearly isn't wearing a seatbelt. How can that be? My mom confusingly looked over to the passenger seat, and of course, the seat was empty. The officer shined his flashlight into the car and froze. My mom turned to look at the officer who was visibly shaken and pale. After a few seconds, the officer began to mutter, No, no, not today, and slowly paced back to his car. In a flash, the officer took off. Must be uncle, she thought. My mom arrived at work and started with her normal routine. The night shift didn't phase her until around 12 a.m., while finishing some patient paperwork, out of the corner of her eyes, she spotted someone walking around in a patient gown. Concerned, she nudged one of her co-workers to check on the patient who was wandering around in the hall. He got up, looked down the hall, and he immediately turned around back towards my mother. 
There was no one there. Confused, she looked over the desk, and indeed, there was no one there except other nurses and doctors. At around 2 a.m., my mom had gotten tired and decided it was time to get some coffee. She got up from her desk and began walking to the break room. On her way to the break room, she spotted the patient, the same patient wandering around the hall. Not wanting to disturb the other patients and nurses, she decided to follow this patient. She followed them until they turned and walked into one of the rooms. She walked up to the room and looked in, expecting to find them. Instead, she walked into an empty cardiology room. My mother walked out and began to think that she was losing her mind. Before exiting the room, she looked at the room number and saw that it read 616. She wrote it down on a notepad and continued with her shift. When her shift ended, she began to put away her work in her locker and pulled out her notepad. She looked at it and it read Cardiology 616. Remembering what had happened, she used the break room phone and called her friend. Half asleep, her friend answered. My mom began to explain what had happened to her and mentioned her experience with the police officer and her shift at the hospital. Finally, my mom asked, How did your uncle pass away, if you don't mind me asking? Oh, he was having some heart problems and passed away from a stroke. When you visited him in the hospital, can you recall what room he was in? Uh, I think it was room 616. I think it was your uncle I saw last night and this morning. No kidding. My mom always told me that story, and she truly believed that she had seen her friend's uncle's ghost. Though the ghost said nothing to my mother, she could only ponder the reason why. About two years ago, my Nana brought home a Ouija board that she found at a yard sale. I have always been a true believer in the paranormal, and it's always been one of my peak interests. I have heard or read enough stories and watched enough shows to know not to mess around with a Ouija board, and quite frankly, they kind of freaked me out, so I wanted nothing to do with it. My Nana, on the other hand, doesn't believe in the paranormal whatsoever, and thought it would just be a fun game for myself, my brother, and the oldest of my two cousins. I left it on the dining room table for days before she made me put it away. I ended up sliding it under my bed in hopes of just forgetting about it. My brother, 11, and my cousin, 12, bugged me about it constantly because they wanted to play with it and I wouldn't let them. I tried to explain to them that it wasn't just a game, and that it shouldn't be messed with, but they were preteen boys who couldn't help but do things that they shouldn't. One day after I got home from work, the boys were there and I had this sneaking suspicion that they played with it. I looked under my bed and it was there, but I just had this odd feeling. That's when I went downstairs and interrogated them about it. At first, of course, they denied it, but I saw right through them until they finally admitted that they had, in fact, played with the board. I asked them if they had said goodbye when they were done, and they claimed that they did. My cousin likes to over-exaggerate stories big time, and makes things up to be overly dramatic, so when he told me about a couple of things that supposedly happened, I didn't believe him at all. Also, they were boys who liked to mess with each other, so I assumed that's what was occurring. Anyways, a couple of nights later, I got in bed, and as I lay there trying to fall asleep, I got this feeling like I was being watched. I looked over at my closet, which has two sliding doors, and I notice one of the doors is slightly opened, leaving a small space. It creeped me out for some reason, so I turned and faced the other way, trying to ignore everything and just fall asleep. I finally passed out, and the next thing I know I'm woken up by what felt like someone or something hitting me in the back of the head. I was lying on my back, so the back of my head was fully on my pillow, which made it even weirder. And it wasn't a light hit, either. It scared me so bad. I was shaking. 
I look around my room and I don't see anything. But then all of a sudden, I hear my floor creaking like someone is walking around my bed. After laying there for a good little while, I finally got the courage to get up and grab my phone and book it to my living room. I sat and tried to calm down. I could still feel a tingling, pulsating sensation at the back of my head. I turned on my phone and realized it was three in the morning. I called my boyfriend, now husband, with tears streaming down my face from being so freaked out. He didn't pick up, and I swear I called him another 15 to 20 times before I finally gave up. I sat in the chair until my Nana got up around 6. I didn't tell her what had happened, because I knew she wouldn't believe me and would say I was acting stupid. After she got up, I had breakfast and then called my boyfriend again, and he finally answered. He told me he had his phone on silent mode so that he didn't know that I had been calling. I gave him so much crap for this, let me tell you. I told him what had happened and he felt so bad and felt like an idiot. He told me he would have come over in a heartbeat to comfort me and was so apologetic. Later that day, he came over and we took the Ouija board to a junkyard to get rid of it. My husband is the only one in my family that knows what happened and I didn't experience anything again after I got rid of the Ouija board. So once again, moral of the story, Ouija boards should not be messed with. I worked at a small, old hospital for a couple of years. Four floors, only two floors being used, and a small ER. I was a med surge RN working 7 p.m. to 7 a.m. Med surge meant that we had patients who just had surgery and also patients who were just sick. Most of the patients were elderly and just sick with things like pneumonia, anemia, acute kidney failure, etc. When older folks get sick, they tend to get confused and might do or say things that they normally wouldn't. But this, whatever the hell it was, was not cool. This was mortifying, and I'm the only one who heard it. We joked that because the hospital was so old that it was creepy, specifically on the right wing of our unit, and obviously at night. Guess who got assigned the right wing that night? I got bedtime meds ready for the old folks down there and started walking down the hall with my med cart and charts for each patient. I'd received report from the previous day's RN. I'd received report from the previous day's RN that room 214 was a woman, call her Kathy, who was only 55 and in for pneumonia, completely alert and oriented. I give the patients down there their meds one by one and yeah, I'm tired and mildly annoyed that it takes room 216 over 10 minutes to swallow a plethora of pills one by one and then proceeded to pull out his IV that was delivering his antibiotics. I digress. So needless to say, it took me a little bit longer to get to room 214. She didn't seem upset, just tired. I did my assessment, and she was, in fact, oriented to day, time, name, and location. I said goodnight after hanging another bag of fluids. I'm hanging out in the hall with my computer documenting my assessments, and I hear something that shook me. It sounded like whispering, but I heard more than one person doing it. I cocked my head up to hear better. I mean, it's night shift and I'm tired, so I'm making sure that I actually did hear this. I followed the noise to the outside of Kathy's room, and there seems to be a full-blown whispery conversation going on with multiple people. I couldn't make out what the different voices were saying, but it sounded like chanting of some sort. I had to make sure that I was legitimately hearing these whispers that seemed like they were coming from different people and try to make sense of it. I walked slowly past her door, which was slightly cracked open. Hoping to hear things more clearly, the whisper chanting sounds only got louder, but were still unintelligible. Kathy, who had been tucked in bed and dozing off when I saw her less than seven minutes ago, was now sitting straight up on the side of her bed, looking away from me at the wall. Doesn't sound that scary, right? Well, Kathy was unable to lift herself out of bed without assistance during my assessment. She was having labored breathing when I assessed her. 
Now Kathy has pulled her nasal cannula out of her nose. That plastic thing that goes around your face that has the two spouts that go up your nose to give you extra oxygen. And sat up in bed in less than seven minutes without struggle. And then she stood up, still looking away. She turned and walked to the bathroom, still without seeing me. Because she was labeled a fall risk, she shouldn't be out of bed alone. I saw her profile, and her lips were not moving. But the whispers grew louder. I panicked, but kept my cool. I briskly walked to the nurse's station and asked if a nursing assistant could please help Kathy with the restroom. I normally would do it myself, but I was rather busy and Kathy was doing quite well on her own. I was sweating, freaking out, and getting further behind on my charting. The nursing aide helped Kathy and didn't report anything unusual when I asked her how she was doing. I swear I heard those voices. They were unsettling, to say the least. I requested the left wing as often as possible after that, and eventually went on to work at a larger hospital. This happened to me when I was in high school. I was at my friend's house at the time who lived in an apartment building. She had a neighbor who lived upstairs and was a few years younger than us who we hung out with when I visited my friend's apartment. On this specific day, my friend's neighbor mentioned that she had a Ouija board and asked if we wanted to use it with her. We both agreed as I personally didn't think Ouija boards were actually paranormal and thought it was a myth. We went into a garage area of the apartment building and put our fingers on the planchette. For the first few hours, nothing really even happened. Eventually, we had movement on the planchette and started asking questions to this spirit, who would answer us. I forgot who, but someone asked if the spirit was trying to communicate with anyone. Interestingly enough, it spelled out my name. I was skeptical and thought it was one of my friends messing with me, so I asked what its name was. It then spelled out my grandmother's name, who died six months before this Ouija board encounter. I started getting a little uncomfortable, as my grandmother's name is in another language, and my friends did not know this language, nor have I ever told them what her name was. They wouldn't even know how to spell it either. Weirded out, I asked what my grandmother wanted. She started spelling out U-R-G-R, -R, and then the planchette started going in weird circles and even going off of the board and wasn't spelling out anything that made sense. So I asked for further clarification, and then just U-R-Great popped up. This will be important later, so keep that in mind. Anyway, at that point I thought it was just one of us moving it weirdly, so I said goodbye. A few days later, my grandmother's husband, my grandfather, suddenly passed away. It was unexpected, as he was in great health, and it was right before Christmas, and he was so excited for Christmas. As I was at his funeral, I remembered sitting there and thinking about the Ouija board, and that's when it hit me. When my grandmother initially tried to spell out something that started with G-R, I realized that grandfather starts with G-R. But then the planchette had moved around so weirdly when my grandmother couldn't spell out the rest of the word, as if something had been stopping my grandmother from completing the word and warning me. The next few months were hell, as I started blaming myself and was convinced that I had somehow contributed to my grandfather's death by using this board. It got to the point that I became suicidal, and the scariest part is, my thoughts felt as if they were not my own. As if something were trying to lead me toward taking my life, as they were very dark. I can't explain it, as it could have been guilt, but I felt like something was watching me all the time and felt a strange presence in the next few months after using the board. There's also the fact that the night of when I used the Ouija board, I was in the bathroom and I was underneath some lights. I had a strange sensation and felt that I needed to walk away, but right when I did, the lights shattered and would have injured me if I had been standing underneath. 
I eventually confessed to my mother about the Ouija board experience, and right when I did, I felt a giant weight lift off of my shoulders. The negative and dark thoughts were slowly disappearing, and I started to not feel the dark presence anymore when I overcame these thoughts. However, I was still wondering if the spirit that I had contacted was even really my grandmother. I also wondered if I was imagining this dark presence and the dark thoughts that I had had. Fast forward, I was at an overnight event at my school and another friend brought a Ouija board. I decided to use it one more time with this friend and try to get some answers. At one point, the Ouija board said that it was trying to contact me specifically. When we asked who it was, it then started spelling out D-E-V. We started panicking, but then it spelled out to a word that I forgot. I dismissed it and thought it was nothing, but my friend decided to look up the word. A few weeks later, she told me that the word meant devil in another language. It was then confirmed to me that it may not have been my grandmother who was contacting me the first time. There is also the fact that there may have been something that was trying to get to me and did not have good intentions. To this day, I am convinced that this spirit only tried to warn me about my grandfather so that when he passed, I would have felt guilty. By feeling guilty, I was more vulnerable to the spirit's influences, to the point that I would almost take my own life. I do not know if this is what actually happened, but it's the only logical explanation that I have. When I was a kid, younger than 12, my mom took me to visit her old friends at their apartment. It was decorated in an odd fashion. Tapestries hung all over the place with old antique furniture and knickknacks lining the walls. We didn't visit there long at all. On our way out the door, my mom pointed out a statue that they had in their living room. It had a beard, eyes that looked straight ahead, and a walking stick that connected to the base of the statue. It was about half my height, hand-carved solid dark wood, and was sort of tribal-looking. I remember thinking, I really hope they don't offer to let her have that thing. It's scary. And, of course, they gave it to her. I felt uncomfortable sharing the car ride back home with the statue. My mom was raving about how cool it was all the way there. I couldn't have been less happy. After we made it back, she placed it down next to the fridge in the kitchen, right outside the entryway. That sucked, because our kitchen was the center of our house. Anywhere you wanted to go, you usually had to walk through the kitchen. So, I told my mom how much I hated the statue, and how I really hated the idea of it being there in particular. My mom told me that I was just being silly, so there it stayed. I didn't get a wink of sleep that night. I couldn't stop thinking about the statue being on the other end of the house, and it terrified me. It made me feel unsafe. I don't know what I found to be so threatening about it, but the next day my grandmother agreed with my feelings. She told my mom that the statue made her very uneasy, and that it had a negative energy. My mom told her that she was overreacting, and that she wasn't getting rid of the statue. I felt constant anxiety. I would often refuse to leave my bedroom in the morning after having violent nightmares involving the statue. It was always something along the lines of the statue becoming animate and stabbing me to death with its walking stick. When I walked through the kitchen, I would literally push my back against the wall and edge around the room to avoid getting near the damn thing. In time, even my mom's friends agreed that it kind of weirded them out too. I hated it. And despite how much it scared people, my mom still wouldn't get rid of it. Though she did finally agree to move it to the living room in a more secluded space. One night I was sitting in the dining room doing my homework, and my mom was in the living room with her friend. I heard whispering that was akin to what you'd hear in a horror movie. Cryptic, overlapping, incoherent whispers. 
I immediately knew that the voices didn't belong to my mom or her friend, so I went into the living room to ask them if they had heard anything, and before I could speak, the look on their faces told me everything. My mom told me to come closer to her and said, we heard them too. We all agreed that the sound was unmistakably close to us, and it was clear as day. The source of the sound had come from, you guessed it, around the same spot that the statue had been moved to. We all just sort of stared at the statue for a minute blankly, and I don't remember what else was said after that. But still, my mom refused to get rid of the statue. The nightmares continued. My anxiety grew worse and worse. Bad things constantly happened in the house. My mom got pregnant sometime around then and had to be hospitalized, so I went to live with my grandma for a bit. I told her all about how my mom never got rid of the statue and how I had never felt safe since it arrived. I told her about the nights that I felt someone looming over me and the times when I locked myself in the bathroom because I heard noise coming from it. After my mom delivered my baby brother, I moved back home. My grandma explained to me that she had burnt the statue long ago and didn't care how my mom felt about it because I didn't deserve to live in fear over a stupid piece of wood. Once the statue was long gone, my mom finally stopped being stubborn and agreed that strange things had occurred. I was finally able to walk through my house again without tiptoeing around it, but sometimes I still felt off about the house after that. The first and only time I've ever seen a ghost, a dead person, a demon, whatever you want to call it, was exactly one year ago today. I had just gotten my bachelor after three years of studying social welfare and was now working at a group home for teens with substance use problems. My workplace was in a big old house, which was almost scary quiet during the nighttime, and I often felt anxious being there. Don't get me wrong. I really enjoyed the job and spending time with the teens, but working nights scared the crap out of me. I usually started my shift around 8 p.m. Around that time, we often made dinner. I helped out with homework, and we talked for hours dealing with all sorts of issues until I went to bed, usually around 1 a.m., and this was one of those days. I fell asleep at 1.30, woke up two hours later like I usually do to get a glass of water. I walked down the stairs, entered the common room, and then walked by a big window in the living room. I looked up at the gray, cloudy sky when I saw death hanging in a tree. Brown, rotten flesh in the shape of a face. I rubbed my eyes and then looked again and the flesh was still there. I couldn't move, breathe, or blink my eyes for a few seconds. I was absolutely terrified. After a while, I found the strength to move my legs and walked into the office again. I locked the door and sat there all night, and when the sun finally peeked out, I managed to move my legs to go and look out the window again. There was no rotten flesh this time, just a normal tree with green leaves. A few days later after this incident, I told my boss that I didn't want to work night shifts anymore since the lack of sleep. I didn't want to tell her the real reason, since she would probably think that I was mad. Maybe I was? And what if this was just a nightmare? Probably. But what if it wasn't? When I was younger, I used to be obsessed with ghosts and all sort of haunting shows. Now, I'd never particularly had a reason to believe that my house was haunted, but one day my brother came home claiming to have found $10 out of nowhere. I'll never know for sure if he was just messing with me, but after curiosity got a hold, I asked him where he really got the money from. 
Stupid me assumed maybe a friend? Perhaps he stole it from my parents' wallet? My parents never claimed to have been missing any money, however, something they definitely would have voiced being distraught about had they noticed that we had taken their cash. The story he gave me was that a young girl, maybe about the age of seven, had followed him onto the school bus that afternoon. He had never met this girl before, and had never seen her around at school, but she decided to sit in the seat right in front of him. After riding the bus for a while, she started to talk to him. Nobody else could see her, according to him, and the other kids were giving him weird looks. Eventually, she handed him ten dollars with a note, and then subsequently got off the bus at the next stop. I immediately assumed that he was lying and laughed, of course. I asked him to show me the note, which he promptly retrieved from his room and passed me a tiny piece of paper. A shiver ran down my spine, as the note wasn't in his handwriting. It read, I'll help you, but only this time, which I believe was in response to the fact that my brother was begging my parents for a Zelda charm bracelet for months, which they refused to buy him. Given that he had ten dollars now, he could just buy it himself, though. Of course, I was extremely intrigued by this, even if it sounded absurd. I suggested we make a makeshift Ouija board to see if we could contact anyone. So we wrote the alphabet on a piece of paper and grabbed a necklace to hover above the DIY board. My brother was interested too, so he decided it could be fun. Mind you, I was in sixth grade and he was in the fourth at the time, so any sort of movement from the necklace caught our attention and we immediately thought that it was a ghost. After asking a few questions, the necklace began to move and shake. Either my brother was really good at tricking me by slowly sliding the necklace across the board, or it really was something paranormal. We were able to get a name. Kate. After asking dumb things like, Did you watch me complete the Shadow Temple in Ocarina of Time? and getting a yes, me and my brother decided to stop for the night after starting to get creeped out. We never said goodbye before ending. Eventually, playing with the board would be a daily occurrence. We thought we'd made a friend, and truly believed that someone was talking to us. Me and my brother decided to take things a step further and try to record something. So we both got our tablets, placed them in front of our TV, and hit record. The first thing I asked was, if someone was here, move something in the room. There was nothing. Okay, well, maybe the ghost is shy? We decided to repeat the same question, but this time we said that we would leave the room and give it a minute. We went downstairs for five minutes, and when we got back up, our tablets had both fallen to the floor and stopped recording. Coincidence? I mean, things fall especially when you're not careful at placing them. So we brushed it off. In December of sixth grade, though, things got really weird. I had started hearing voices in my head, claiming that they were the ghost I was talking to while playing the Ouija board. I got so scared one night that I had grabbed the Bible that one of my religious friends had gifted me, and would sleep with it. Eventually, I told my mom that there was a ghost telling me scary things. I won't get into detail, as some of it was a little graphic. She and my dad argued for a while about whether or not I was schizophrenic, and if I should see a therapist. So, out of fear, I never told them that I was hearing voices again, but I would space out often, talking and having conversations with this thing that I believed to be a ghost. Eventually, I forgot about the ghost, and we no longer talked. I will never know what that voice was, if I was genuinely insane, or if they were just intrusive thoughts. I was just glad for it finally to have stopped. Nothing necessarily paranormal has happened to me since, besides my TV turning on randomly in the middle of the night or feeling that someone was pushing my legs with some sort of unknown force every once in a while. I sum it up to just be my imagination playing tricks on me now, but I do still have this looming feeling that ever since I've played with that Ouija board, I have some sort of spirit attached to me following me. Not a bad one, but just... A constant presence.
During the summer of last year, I was visiting my family in my grandma's house. I met up with my cousins and we decided to take the day to go out, eat, and catch up. After countless conversations regarding how my grandmother was still extremely religious, Muslim, we reflected on how we turned out not to be so religious and laughed. Until we had the brilliant idea of playing with the Ouija board in my grandma's living room, where, mind you, she had a chandelier that played two small verses from the Quran every time it was turned on. When we went back to the house, it was already nighttime, but we decided to wait a little longer before we began. Meanwhile, out of curiosity, we asked our grandma about the Quran lights. She said that her uncle had installed them about six years ago and that they had stopped working, reciting the verses not actually lighting up the place. About a month after he bought them, and she laughed it off. Later, when we found that the living room was vacant, it was our perfect chance. We turned off all the lights and settled around the table where we placed the Ouija board and everything. We began the process, following the instructions carefully. After about 15 minutes of nothing, we decided that the Ouija board didn't work and that we didn't have the true paranormal experience that we wanted. It was our first time playing, or trying to. We closed it up and I got up to go turn the lights back on. And the second I did so, the chandelier started reciting holy verses of the Quran. I froze in place and stared at my cousins, who looked just as shocked as me. I turned the lights off immediately and got out of the room while one of my cousins rushed to take the Ouija board out of the room as well. One of my cousins said that this is a warning from God, that a spirit had entered and that the Quran was pushing it away. I didn't believe him, but we turned the lights on again and that time, the verses didn't play. I thought it might have been a coincidence. A creepy one. But a coincidence nevertheless. My cousin grabbed the Ouija board and stepped back in with it, and she turned on the lights. And again, the chandelier recited the verses. This time she looked at me and said that there was no way that it could be a coincidence. We all agreed that we wouldn't mess around with it again, and we threw out the Ouija board the next morning. The chandelier never recited the Quran again, and we never told our grandma about it. I work in a place with five floors and a basement. It used to be a house for nuns and priests. I have divided the story into small parts describing everything I've seen on each floor. I got called up for a night shift since a colleague called in sick. I've never done a night shift here, so I took up the opportunity to see what it was like. Fourth floor. Doing your rounds isn't the creepiest thing at all. The creepiest thing is going down the stairs again. You will see a black figure walking the hallway. Just your average shadow, you know. Well, thing is, the lift sometimes randomly goes to that floor during the night, as if someone is calling it. Third floor. Doing your rounds gets a little weirder here, since it seems as though you aren't alone whilst on the floor. You will hear footsteps and see shadows on the wall walking past you. Second floor. Exactly the same as third floor except for one painting. It has a woman in it that sometimes changes position or even completely disappears. First floor. You will sometimes hear the piano play a D note on the floor above you. Main floor. There is a black leather couch in the hallway where you will sometimes find a see-through man sitting with a cigar and newspaper. He smiles and disappears when you greet him. Basement. The helpful poltergeist resides here. This is the place where before my current company took up the building, the morgue was. There currently are our storage rooms, but the rooms aren't marked with what is in them. But that doesn't matter, because the night shift always gets knocks on the door to indicate where the item is. A 
I first discovered the Ouija board when I was 14. A girl was visiting from America, I'm in the UK, and she told us how to talk to ghosts. Eight of us went to her house and made a board with ripped bits of paper and a turned wine glass. Four of us would put our fingers on the glass, and we would swap someone out every so often. This way we believed that it would eliminate anyone who might be pushing the glass. I'll add here that the finger that had been in the glass always felt cold afterward. Don't know if others have noticed this. The first few days were spent asking silly questions like, does so-and-so fancy me, or who will I marry, etc. On the third day, things took a darker turn, and we started getting responses told to us without asking. It started saying things like, so-and-so will get run over, and X will die of cancer, and other really freaky shit. This scared us, and we stopped playing. Years later, in my early 20s, I shared a flat with my brother and boyfriend at the time, and bored one night we decided to do a Ouija board. So we made a board, as I had when I was younger, and set to it. It didn't take long for the glass to move, and we asked who it was, where they came from, and how they had died. It told us its name was Bill. He was an old hippie, and he had died from an overdose. Anyhow, things went on for a while, then my boyfriend, who was convinced that we were the ones pushing the glass, said if there's really a ghost here, prove it. I kid you not, not a second later, the lights went out. At that time, I had one of those old-fashioned meters that you had to put money in, so after my initial shock, I reasoned that I needed to put a coin in the meter and stood up to do it. But before I got to the door, the lights came back on. Somewhat spooked, I sat back down and me and my brother put our fingers back on the glass. My boyfriend point-blank refused. The glass then spelled out, Chilly trick, hey. After that, it kept going in circles and moving toward me, so I decided that enough was enough and said goodbye. A few years ago, after Facebook started and I got back in touch with my old school friends, I heard that one of them had died of cancer in his late teens. Not sure about the other prophecy, but I know that I'll never do a Ouija board again, and I firmly believe that we do tap into forces beyond our five senses. At the time of this story, I was a 16-year-old high school student. I got a babysitting job for a couple who had a family wedding and needed a babysitter for a super late night. I was referred to them by another family that I used to sit for. Keep in mind, this was when cell phones were just coming out, so I had a really crappy flip phone with a certain amount of minutes. There were three kids. The oldest was a boy about eight, the middle boy was about six and there was a little girl who was a toddler in diapers and couldn't speak. I came in while the sun was still up to meet the kids while the parents were still there. The parents were so cool. They showed me where all the snacks were and gave me the ground rules for the night. Kids in bed by 7.30, teeth brushed, you know the drill. Once they left, we started eating dinner. To my shock, the middle child, who we'll call Teddy, kept throwing his fork hard at his siblings and pinching his sister with his nails under the table. He kept kicking my shins and throwing his food around the room. The moment his parents left, he became a terror. Their house was old but remodeled, so their toys were in the basement playroom. After dinner, we all went in there to play. As soon as we went down the stairs, it felt wrong. Don't get it twisted. It was a beautiful finished basement with a couch, flat screen, and toys, but something just felt creepy about it. Then the little girl kept pointing at a blank wall, one with no pictures or anything on it, and kept screaming at the top of her lungs and crying. It really unnerved me. At this point, I'm getting a terrible, really bad feeling. So I say, let's go upstairs and watch TV till bedtime. 
The kids seemed to love that idea. So I carry the little girl upstairs and turn on the TV for the three of them and then go back down to grab her favorite stuffed dog and clean up a bit. When I turn around to walk upstairs, I see Teddy smiling a sickening smile at the top of the stairs. He has his hands on the light switch. My stomach dropped. I didn't have my phone or a light. And if this little shit locks me down here, I thought. The light switch is at the top of the stairs outside the stairway, so if he closed the door, I was screwed. And sure enough, he flicked off the lights, cackled, and went to slam the door and lock me in the dark basement. I have never moved so fast in my existence. I flew up the stairs and shoved my hand into the door to keep him from locking me down there. I asked him why he did that and yelled at him to never do that again. All he did was smile at me and then slowly walk away, giggling. I iced my hand and watched him closely for the rest of the night. Bedtime comes around and I put the kids to bed upstairs without any problems. There were three bedrooms, the parents' room at the end of the long hall, then the baby girl's room in the middle, and the boys shared a room with the bunk bed at the end of the hall by the top of the stairs. Everything finally seemed quiet, and I began to forget the horrors from earlier and started watching TV. About an hour after I put her down, the baby girl started screaming through the baby monitor. A scream that sounded like she was in pain. Thinking her brother Teddy was bothering her, I ran upstairs to stop him. As soon as I get to the top of the stairs, I see him laying down on his bed facing the wall. The baby is hysterical and is again pointing at nothing and crying. I am freaked out by now. I rock the baby back to sleep, check on the boys, then return to the living room. What the hell is happening? Am I imagining things? I shake it off and turn the TV back on. This is when the night goes from bad to a total nightmare. Once back in the living room, I start to hear screaming every couple minutes. What sounds this time like a grown man screaming in pain. At first I thought it was outside or maybe a TV or a radio, so I ignored it and kept watching television. But soon, it became clear that it wasn't a joke, and it wasn't my imagination. It was coming from inside the house. Then, I hear what sounds like little feet running upstairs in the hallway. For a second, I'm not scared anymore. I'm angry that Teddy's out of bed two plus hours after bedtime. I go to the bottom of the stairs and holler up Teddy's name and tell him to go back to sleep. I don't hear a response, but I do hear the footsteps continue. Then I hear what I think is him run into his parents' room at the other end of the hall. Feet pounding down the hallway clear as day. So I sprint up there thinking I've caught him in the act. The hall is empty and dark. I turn and I find Teddy is sitting up in his bed. He's staring at me again with that sickening smile. I could see his brother was asleep on the top bunk, and I could see that his baby sister was asleep on the monitor in my hand. He gave me the creeps. I told him to lay back down. I go back downstairs to the middle floor. I then hear someone walking up from the basement, and I lost it. I slammed and locked the basement door, and I called my house number. My big brother answers, and I tell him that I'm scared. He puts me on speaker, and I explain everything to my family. I babysit every weekend, and I've never had a negative experience or called them like this, so luckily they believed me. My grandpa, being a super religious man, prayed with me and calmed me down. My big brother got into his car and came to sit with me until the parents got home, but the town I was in was a bit of a drive, so he told me he'd be there in 40 minutes. 
Even after we hung up, I could hear the footsteps running around the house. I am not a religious person, but I sat on the couch and prayed and cried. I have never been so scared in my life. I was terrified. The parents came home before my brother got there and they saw that I had been crying. They asked what happened and I told them everything non-supernatural that occurred because I didn't want them to think I was a crazy person or tell people not to hire me. I just wasn't going to mention it at all. So I just said Teddy was a handful and that was it. As I was leaving, the dad, in a deadly serious voice, said, Did the ghost bother you? I slowly turned to him, not fully believing what I had just heard. I asked him if he was being serious. He said, Oh, I'm being serious. We've had a ghost problem for a while now. Did you experience anything yourself? I broke down and started crying when I gave them an honest recap of the night. I told them about the screams that I heard, the footsteps, everything. How the baby was crying at the wall and how Teddy tried locking me in the basement. They believed me right away. The parents said they'd moved into the house about two years ago after the old man who built the house died inside of it. He was an actual hoarder and fell and injured himself in the basement and died among his piles. Since no one could hear him scream, they didn't find him in time. By all accounts from the neighborhood, he was a mean recluse of a man. Either way, what a terrible way to go. They said they would wake up every night to things flying off of their kitchen counters and doors slamming. They would hear knocks and pounding in the walls. I was shocked. I asked why they stayed in the house if they knew it was haunted. They explained they weren't able to move due to their jobs and current financial situation. I have to admit that although it wasn't huge, it was a beautifully built home. That old construction kind of home with bookshelves built into the walls and a winding grand staircase. The dad said he would go downstairs every night for a year and say, Go away. This is our home now. You aren't welcome here. Over and over. He said eventually the activity stopped. They said it only sparked up when someone new would stay in the house or when they'd have a sitter at night. They said since I quote-unquote knew the truth now, that they would pay me extra to come back because they could never keep a babysitter. Pfft. Yeah, right, I thought. I am never going back there. But I said I'd be in touch, and I ran out of that house. I am ashamed to say that I never answered their calls again. I felt bad, but there was no way in hell I'd ever return there. I still babysit once in a while, and I've never had any experience like that since. I still think of those kids sometimes, and I really think that Teddy was being affected by the spirit there. I've never encountered a child so cruel, so negative. Thinking of his creepy little smile still sends a chill down my back. I hope they were able to move or clear the negative energy. Either way, it's one night I won't forget. All this started when I was in middle school. I was young and stupid and seriously interested in the paranormal. I grew up in a religious home, and I am still religious. I have no explanation for what happened to me. I started experimenting with the paranormal with my friends. We thought it would be really cool to use a Ouija board. At first, nothing seemed to happen, but then the board started to move. We asked all the normal stupid questions like, who's there, or is anyone here? It moved really slow and steady. I was sure that my friend was messing with me. I got spooked and we threw out the board. But that is not where this story ends. Moving forward, I started having really weird nightmares. 
I would consistently wake up at 3 a.m. or not be able to sleep at all. I was basically a zombie throughout my entire day. There was one time when I was at home alone on FaceTime when I heard my mom yell my name. I yelled back and didn't get a response. My friend then reminded me that I was home alone. I immediately checked my whole house and no one was there. She heard the voice too though, so it couldn't be explained. I continued hearing voices and knocks and was still unable to sleep. There was one time where I was in my room doing homework and someone pulled my hair so hard that my head actually yanked down. I got so spooked that I ran to my dad and told him what had happened. He obviously didn't really believe me. My brother started noticing weird things too and that's when I got really uncomfortable. He and I were in my room and I went to the bathroom. When I came out, his face was stone white. He claimed he saw a little girl run past my bedroom door. It couldn't have been me because I used the bathroom connected to my room. We don't have any other siblings. Another time I was on FaceTime again with a separate friend and I had my phone out in front of me when I walked into my bathroom. My friend asked, what is that behind you? And as soon as she said that, the lights shut off. I sprinted to my brother's room and of course nobody believed me again. The icing on the cake though was when I was asleep one night and I woke up suddenly. It was 3 a.m. again and I was completely paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move. All I could see was a hooded figure in all black staring at me from the corner of my room. I couldn't see its eyes. I just knew that it was looking at me. It began to float toward me, and then pressed all of its weight on my chest. I couldn't talk or move. After silently crying for what felt like forever, I finally croaked out the word Jesus, and it fled from the room through my door. After that incident, I told my mom everything about the Ouija board and the experiences, and she finally believed me. She could see how scared that I truly was and knew that I couldn't be lying. She immediately got to work and blessed me and the house. I haven't had anything that terrifying happen to me since, and I no longer live in that home. So I've been watching Bad Mood Rude, and she posted the sellers where she gets her haunted dolls from. I decided to get one for myself, and her name is Sandy. Some info about Sandy. Her husband was in the mob. She had alcohol and drug issues. She's nice and loves music. She also has PTSD. I've had Sandy for three days now, and I've already had some experiences with her. My first experience was her giving me one of her PTSD episodes. I think she was trying to show me how it feels for her. But how it started was my left arm got cold, and then it started getting pins and needles. My heart started racing, so I sat up in bed and started taking deep breaths, and I said to Sandy, Wow, Sandy, that's intense. You're really strong. As in, her energy is really powerful, and from my right side, I heard a faint, echoey voice say, Oh, I'm sorry. And eventually it stopped, and I heard her crying, because I think she was scared. I told her that she was okay, and to come and sit in bed with me, and crying stopped. To add, Sandy used to have fights with her husband a lot, and when this happened, my roommates, they're a couple, were having a fight. I heard them going back and forth through the vent. On the second day, I was in bed, with my boyfriend beside me watching TikTok. I hear outside our door what sounds like heels walking on some sort of hard flooring. Note, we don't have anyone in the house who wears heels and we have like plastic thin flooring. Hopefully someone knows what I mean. It went on for a bit, then no walking, and it starts again. I tell my boyfriend, hey babe, uh, do you hear that sound? Ironically, our other roommate in the room beside us walks out to go to the washroom at the same time as I heard the heels tapping, so my boyfriend thought I was just crazy and said that it was our roommate, even though he's a dude and very much doesn't wear heels. Today I did a spirit box, and Sandy came through giving me clear answers and in full sentences, and she likes living with me apparently, so I'm happy with that. 
Sandy is really great, and I love having her here. She always seems to show me her presence, but not my boyfriend, who's a huge non-believer in ghosts. And I really think she likes me because I want to help her with her PTSD, and instead of freaking out about the PTSD episode, I handled it and tried my best to get her to calm down. Every time I get up, I feel her following me, and it's like she's watching over me, protective, basically. She had kids while she was alive. I really love having her in my home, and she's not scary at all. I know a lot of people are going to say negative stuff on this post, like, why would you invite a spirit into your home on purpose, and, oh, all spirits are negative. And to that I say, well, I like the paranormal, and Sandy is not negative. If she was, I would feel it. I would feel fear when she shows her presence, and she would be trying to hurt me. But she doesn't want to hurt me. Very clearly, she just wants to be understood and be known that she is there. She's honestly so sweet and motherly. She's just got some issues like any living person does, because she was living once too. I'm not a superstitious person, and I know that not all spirits are bad, and this is a PSA for everyone. Not all spirits are bad, but a lot of people like to assume that they are, and I don't like that at all. People like to only notice the bad ones and ignore the good spirits. Personally, I look at all spirits as good, but sometimes troubled. I would like to share my recent experience. This is absolutely true and in no way fabricated. I have been shaken up immensely and my perspective on reality has definitely changed. I live in India and my family is Protestant Christian. My upbringing and the things taught to me in terms of faith have included an aspect of the supernatural and the spiritual. Though it was always told to me that demons and spirits of darkness exist, I was always a skeptic. I believed in proof, evidence, and logic. In my opinion, exorcisms were staged and everything about it was fake. Until I had what seems to be my own personal experience with the demonic. This happened about a week ago. I was on my bed playing a racing game on my phone at 2 a.m. The lights were off, and the only light was that of my phone. I usually put my AirPods on and keep my volume on full as I enjoyed the loud, engine-revving sounds of the game. I started feeling an ache in my back, and this made me think I was having another bout of kidney stone pain. It runs in my family. My way of coping with it is to just ignore it, and move on with things. I've had multiple stones in my body, so I have learnt to manage the discomfort well by now. As I continued with the game, I started feeling breathless as the air was heavy. It came to a point where I thought something was definitely wrong. There was a dull pain in my stomach and head too. The sounds and music of the game I was playing became very muffled and scary. I managed to pull out my headphones and lie down. I laid out on the bed, on my back, looking up at the ceiling, wondering what was going on. My wife is working abroad for now, and I really wanted to ring her. I was not able to do that, however, because somehow logic and common sense had taken a back seat at that moment. I just wasn't able to think clearly. My palms and forehead were covered in sweat and felt crushed, like under weight, of something terribly heavy. I honestly thought I was about to die. My mom had visited me in March of this year and has not been able to since leave and head back to her own house due to the lockdown. So she was sleeping in the guest room and usually fast asleep at that hour. My mom is a very deep sleeper and rarely gets up for anything in the night. During all this madness that I was going through, she just woke up and came to my door and knocked. I heard the knocks, and I wanted to say, please come in and help me, but my mind was too confused to do anything. She heard some groaning-like sounds coming from me and decided to let herself in. 
When I looked at her, I wanted to say help, but apparently I kept saying just let me be. Let me die in peace. My mom told me this later. When she saw me in the state that I was, without any hesitation, she touched my head and said, In the name of Yeshua, I bind you, rebuke you, and cast you out. I felt the immediate sensation of wanting to puke. I rushed to the loo and did so. Instantly, I felt better, and my mind began working correctly. I could think straight and had no trouble breathing. The whole recovery didn't take more than a couple of minutes. While I know that this can be dismissed as a simple case of indigestion, or acidity, food poisoning, or even an anxiety attack, here are some reasons why it's got to be more. 1. The probability of my mom walking in that time was very low. Later when I asked her why she came in at that hour, she simply said, because I felt like I should like a prompting in my spirit. 2. Why would I say things like, just let me die? Any person in need of medical attention will cry for help rather than wanting to be left alone. 3. Why did I need to puke just after my mom said those words? 4. I had eaten dinner at 5 p.m. If it had something to do with that, why would it surface at 2 in the morning the next day? And 5. About a month before all this happened, I had a nightmare about an entity in my room. Something that looked like a black being with red eyes and teeth like a wolf, grinding its teeth at me or making low-pitched growls. I was scared after that, but I had dismissed it and moved on. I am really beginning to think that what I went through was a spiritual, demonic oppression, which retreated due to the compulsion from a higher spiritual authority. I was a senior in high school, and I always hung out with my sister, who was five years older than me, and her friends. That night it was us siblings, her best friend H, who was the same age as my sister, and our friend G, who was about 20 and enlisted in the army. We thought it would be a great idea, since it was close to Halloween, to play with a Ouija board for the first time. We got a Ouija board and decided to turn off all the lights in the house and light a few candles to really set the mood. So we sat on the floor of the living room and started our little game. I was sitting between H and G, across from my sister. It took a while, but we finally got a response when G asked if anyone was there. The planchette slid to yes. We kind of giggled because we thought it was one of us. But then it started spelling out Mama. My sister and I immediately go pale and make eye contact across the board. Our grandmother had passed away next door, about a year prior to this. Before we could ask another question, the planchette spelled out the word love. We still weren't convinced. A little spooked, but not scared. G then asked the board, how many children do you have? And the planchette slid to the number two, which is the correct number of kids that our grandmother had. It's important to know that G and H didn't know very much about our grandmother. They came into our lives after our grandmother had passed, so they never met her. The planchette then spelled out the words, Roll Tide. Now we live in Alabama, and my grandmother was the biggest Alabama football fan. She would watch every game. The Alabama football catchphrase is, Roll Tide. My sister and I immediately begin crying because it just seems so unreal. And then the planchette starts moving again. This time it's sliding around and going to the word goodbye. I ask, do you want us to stop playing? And the planchette quickly slides to yes. My sister doesn't want to stop. She asks, but why? We want to ask you more questions. And the planchette quickly moves across the board to spell out the word bad. That was more than enough for me. I felt like if this was my mama, and she was telling us to stop playing, maybe we should take her advice and quit while we were ahead. She said bad. 
Did that mean that something bad would happen? Or that doing that was bad with the Ouija board? I don't want to find out. But after trying to convince my sister and friends, it did no good. The planchette keeps circling the board and going back to goodbye over and over again. Finally, everyone says goodbye because it's clear that nothing else was going to be discussed. But then, for some reason, I was talked into participating again. This time, when something answered us back, the planchette moved across the board even faster. But it was between two letters only. Z-O-Z-O-Z-O. -O -O -O. And that's all it would say. I don't know what the others felt, because we really didn't talk about it much. But to me, it felt like the room became colder. It was then unanimous that we did decide to say goodbye. We were shaking. Whatever we had just spoken to didn't feel right. My sister and I decided to sleep in the same bed. I remember lying in bed and being huddled together and just looking around the room. Every sound made me jump. I swear, I could see dark humanoid figures all around. Maybe it was paranoia, but I definitely did not sleep at all that night. I kept thinking about how Mama or whatever was imitating her had said bad like it was a warning. My sister ended up getting rid of the board shortly after. I'm not sure what she did with it. I know her and some other friends tried to play with it again in a very old graveyard near our house with graves that dated back to the 1800s. While they were playing, they heard what sounded like footsteps in the woods around the graveyard and what sounded like scraping on one of the headstones. I don't plan on touching another Ouija board again. I was going to my sister's graduation in Binghamton University and my family rented out a quote-unquote well-priced Airbnb for two nights. The only one that had five bedrooms because extended Chinese family. It was a Victorian era house completely decked out with Victorian American aesthetics. It had trinkets, paintings of serious children, photos of even more serious people. It had ornate floral wallpaper and dolls. Many dolls. We were picking out bedrooms, and no one in my family wanted the room with the creepy dolls. I'm not superstitious, and I didn't see the room, and I didn't understand the gravity of the situation, so I was like, sure, I'll take the room with the dolls. You see where this is going. As midnight approached, I got tired, even after being energized by a tiny bite of baklava and an espresso. So I was the first to go to bed. I went into the room and saw the dolls. They were locked inside a glass case, all facing the bed. I was like, um, okay, don't be silly. Also, you're a brave trans girl, and they're probably more afraid of you than you are of them. Because you're something they've likely never encountered before. Silly thoughts. I decided to take out my pocket knife and sleep with it at the nightstand so that I would have some protection. I watched YouTube for a while and turned off the lamp and went under the covers. I felt the doll staring, but my rational side told me, it's all in my head. By 3 a.m., I was half conscious. I was slipping in and out of pure unconsciousness. While I was in a dreamlike state, I was aware of everything going on around me. The dolls just kept staring. Were they next to me? I was afraid to open my eyes. I blinked and I thought, it's okay, I have protection. I didn't dare look at the knife on the nightstand. I was afraid that I would see a doll next to me. Then I remembered, statistically, armed victims of assault tend to have their weapons taken away and used against them, and I thought, oh my god, I am going to be stabbed to death. Then I heard vividly, in a playful, childlike voice, it would be my heart's desire. I immediately became alert. It was like R2-D2 rebooting after being in low power mode. Adrenaline rushed through me. I heard a ringing in my ear as my awareness went from 0 to 60 in a split second. I stayed like that until the sun started to rise at around 5 a.m. That was when I fell back asleep. When I woke up, I dreaded having to sleep there again for yet another night. That night I thought, 
you know what? Violence begets violence. So I slept with my pocket knife in my bag instead. I fell asleep and slept peacefully through the night. I've always loved the paranormal. Even as a little girl, I found it fascinating. I've had a few encounters in the past, and my house is also haunted. But on to the first paranormal experience that I ever had. I was watching the 1994 version of Little Women with my mom and grandmother in my room when I saw movement out of the corner of my eye on my bookshelf where my dolls were. The air was off, but I could see that one of the doll's dresses was billowing around her and one of my other dolls was reaching out to her. I brushed it off as my mind playing tricks. I should mention that my mom rearranged them that day and had them all facing the same direction. Skip to the next day, I had walked out of my room because my grandmother had called me to ask me something and I walked back in and all my dolls were turned in different directions and facing different ways. I ran out of my room screaming. My mom didn't believe me until I showed her. She fixed them again. My room had always been off, and I had obtained more dolls from a family friend a few years later, and this is when things really got weird. I have two musical dolls, and they would go off randomly sometimes. I started to feel like I was watched and I wasn't alone, but I just brushed it off as paranoia because I had never experienced anything major other than some of my dolls appearing to move every once in a while. Skip again to college after years of dealing with minimal doll movement, something changed. I was in my room one night and I felt something breathe down my neck and it scared me so much that I didn't sleep in my room that night. My parents divorced when I was 15, and my dad was dating this girl who loved the paranormal and was also a medium. I asked her when she came over to check out and cleanse my room. The moment she stepped in there, she looked at me and asked if there was a doll in my closet. My heart sank because a family friend had given me a porcelain baby doll that was practically life-size, but it had no eyes. That was the one in my closet, and she confirmed that it was the one that she was getting negative vibes from. She prayed over my room, saged it, and I still have the rose quartz in my room that she gave me. I got rid of the majority of my dolls, and I don't feel anything in there anymore. This is just one of many experiences I've had and thought I would share. I still constantly check my bookshelf just to make sure, and it's been almost two years since I got rid of my haunted dolls but I don't think I'll ever forget. I work in a hospital as a nurse. I was on a row of nights, which I dread. I ended up having five patients, two of which were under care for cancer. There are two events in here from two separate nights. One. The night started normally as I assessed and passed meds to the patients and did my charting and other night duties, stocking and other stuff. Just around 11 p.m., one of my palliative patients started ringing, complaining that there was a kid running into the room laughing and playing when they should be in bed. I checked the room to make sure that there was no one in there and reassured him that there were no children in the hospital area where we were. I made him comfortable and left the room. He rang again. I went back to the room to see what he rang for. Agitated, he said that he was just looking to rest comfortably and that people should keep their children under control and not let them jump on his bed playing and laughing. This time, I got the chills, but again, I reassured him that there were no children since it wasn't the pediatric ward. I told him that I would bring him a sleeping pill to help him fall asleep, but that I would be a few minutes. I start walking back toward the desk and medication room to grab the pill. A bell rang. I turned around and saw that the indicator above his door was flashing. Slightly annoyed, I walked back to his room. He was agitated in his bed again and I asked him what was wrong. He again complained about the kid. He said he was just in there again. 
I leaned over the bed and calmly explained, there are no children in this hospital. Look, you need to get some rest. He replied loudly, he is standing right behind you. I stood up instantly and slowly turned around. Creeped out, I turned to face the patient, and before I could speak, he says, he ran into the closet, referring to the lockers where patients can store items. I slowly opened the locker and saw that his jacket was swinging, but no one was in there. I turned and told him that there was no one. I rushed into the med room to give him that sleeping pill. Two. This will be a short one. I came out of one of my patient's rooms and was sanitizing my hands, but facing the wall. As I was rubbing my hands together, I noticed the shadow of someone walk out of the room next door and then walk into the room across from it as I turned to see. I went into the room where I had seen it go. I asked the patient, who wasn't one of mine, if anyone had come in there. She replied no, but with a shaky voice. I checked the room to make sure that there was indeed no one. I left that room and went into the room where it had came from. I looked around, but again, no one was in there. I checked the patient, who again was not assigned to me, and found that he had died. He was palliative. I walked out of the room immediately to inform the nurse who had the patient that he had died. She asked me to come with her to check the patient because she had been having creepy vibes every time she went in there. I agreed, and we went. She did the assessment where you listen for a full minute. When she was done, we heard knocking on the wall. She said, see, it's creepy. I didn't think anything of it until she said, we are on the fourth floor and on the other side of that wall is the outside of the building. We quickly left the room. Four of us came in there to shroud the body. This experience left me pretty shaken up for a while. To begin, I was a fairly depressed and antisocial 15-year-old in high school, and on weekends I'd go and stay with my older sister in her apartment to get away from my parents and finally just relax. During this time, I'd gotten into studying astral projection, and I'd always been interested in the paranormal, as my mom and I had experienced things in our house, and my mom claimed that she could see the spirits. Anyway, one day after some reading, I decided to take the bus over to Toys R Us, where they still to this day sell Ouija boards to kids. I bought one of the silly glow-in-the-dark ones. My sister and I were really excited to start using it. Within a few minutes of putting our hands on the planchette, it began moving in a circle. Our first introduction was a little girl named Sarah. We end up chatting with this little spirit all night. Then it turns into every single weekend. We begin to feel almost addicted to the board, always going to chat with Sarah. It was a long time ago, but I remember her saying that she was from the 1800s. She'd be so excited to talk every time we showed up. The planchette would spin in circles all over the board. We could even take our hands off of it, and it would continue to move. The addiction to the board goes on for months. Finally, one day, we decide to ask Sarah to physically show us that she exists. We ask for a sign, and a strong breeze shoots straight into my ear so hard that I jumped back from the board. There was no AC on, no windows open, and no fans in the room. From here on, things get odd, and Sarah says that she is attached to me. I started getting an off feeling, and I ask, Are you really Sarah, or are you someone else? Some of the things you say are pretty adult for a young girl. Then the planchette began to playfully spin all over the place, ending on no. I feel a sense of almost maniacal laughter in the air. It's hard to explain, but my sister feels it too. Turns out Sarah was actually a man named Solomon. Solomon said that he loved me and that he was going to follow me. From there, we were freaked out and decided to stop using the board, but the pull was strong and it legitimately feels as if it were an addiction. 
After this incident, I can almost always feel someone watching me when I'm alone. I'd see the shape of a man in my head and the dark windows at night, but just for a second, enough to make me think I was losing my mind. I was frequently exploring church with my sister and was so scared from seeing figures pass by the windows and from feeling someone standing behind me that I told the preacher about our Ouija board use. He said he would pray and that I would have to ignore the spirit. Not the greatest advice. A month later, I had an odd and terrifying dream. Suddenly I'm above my body and in the den in my parents' house where I'd fallen asleep on the couch late at night. I look down at myself and then feel a presence by my body's head behind the couch near the hallway. There is a man standing there. He's wearing a black leather jacket, fitted, vintage-looking jeans, dark boots, kind of 40s, 50s-ish biker style. He was probably in his mid-twenties. He had pale skin, dark, short-cut hair, and totally black eyes. He's almost attractive if he weren't terrifying. He smiles at me eerily, and at light speed, jumps for my body. I panic and jump too, trying to get back into my body before he does. I wake up in a panic, sweating and shaking. Somehow, I eventually fall asleep at first light. And then when I awaken in the late afternoon, my mom tells me that she woke up to use the bathroom at night and fell to the ground in the living room having a seizure. I didn't know what to do or say. I was shocked. Could it have been from the paranormal encounter? Because she's a sensitive too? She used antidepressants frequently and switched them around a lot. But what a strange coincidence for it to happen that night. After that incident, life just continued on. So much of my teenage life felt negative at that age already that I just kept trekking forward, feeling someone behind me on some days, some days not. The energy in my family's home was generally bad. Parents fighting constantly, father using drugs, mom in different phases of her bipolar. Definitely some energy a bad spirit or two could feed on. Fast forward to sophomore year in high school. I used to sit in the corner in band, doing homework quietly, and one day, a girl known as the school witch comes up to me. We maybe talked a few times, but didn't know each other very well. She simply states, So there's a man following you. A spirit. I'm going to do a spell for you tonight to make him leave. Once again shocked, I tell her that there has been someone following me. She nods like, yes, obviously, then walks away before I can say anything else. By junior year, I'm dating a boy who lost his brother to suicide, only months before we'd met. One night he calls in a panic and states that he was brutally attacked by a male spirit or demon in a dreamlike yet awake state. He said he felt someone sitting on him and could see a black spirit in the room. He called his brother's spirit to save him. He claims he felt a whoosh of energy and that his brother pushed the spirit off of his chest. He woke up really scared, saying that he'd never felt anything like it and that he'd never had negative spirit encounters before except as a small child. What scares me is that he'd randomly have episodes after this that made him not in his right mind or almost mad. At the time, I'd felt and seen his brother's spirit twice, and it was never a hostile feeling. I felt somewhat protected while dating him because of this, but Solomon's negative spirit was something I still worried about and felt on occasion. Years go by, and I eventually become best friends with a girl whose family ghost hunts. We ghost hunt together, experience some creepy stuff, and I become less fearful. Two years into our relationship, I get the courage to tell her psychic aunt my story, and she seeks to find out more about this spirit. She connects with him and laughs some. He's 5150, hun. He's absolutely mad. He's not necessarily evil, but he attached himself to you because he likes how easily he can scare you. He doesn't necessarily want to hurt you, but your fear gives him pleasure. In life, it seems, he was quite mentally ill. I was absolutely stunned. 
It all made so much sense. And how would she know this? After the talk, my best friend and her aunt tell him to F off. And to imagine a white light and to let him know he's not welcome. This seems forward. But one night I feel the presence and it angers me. Years of someone just wanting to scare me. I yell at the empty room that I'm not afraid of him and that he's not welcome. I use sage, imagine white light, and yell for him to leave. I feel a stir in the energy, almost like he's not even that angry to leave. It felt more like an annoyance at losing his fear target. From that point on, I've had the upper hand. There was one more experience with him one day at 25 while in a toxic living situation. This was six years after the experience with my friend's aunt. I left my body again and was excited. Finally, astral projecting as an adult. I sit up and lo and behold, there he is standing by the bed. But this time I shoot white light at him. He's gone in an instant. Then my toxic roommate at the time walks through the wall to grab me. I wake up. Was he trying to warn me? Does he still visit me? Can I ever make him leave for good? Sometimes I wonder if he ever felt compassion for me. It was all so strange, and I frequently meditate and banish negative spirits or energy from around me. I've shut down a lot spiritually because of these incidents. I constantly state that nothing is allowed to bother me, but I wonder if somehow he'll be there forever. It worries me sometimes, especially because he'd stated on the board that he didn't want anyone to have me. I feel confident that spiritually I am strong, but I've always wondered if there was some deeper level of banishing that I could have, or should have done, or could still do. Anyway, I wanted to share this story because it's been both such a weight and a mystery to me for so many years. I don't know what I believe anymore. Sometimes I wonder if my extremely negative state of mind drew him to my depressed teenage self. Maybe somehow I created this negative entity? I doubt that one, but it is still possible. I feel in a much better place mentally, physically, and spiritually now, so I don't feel threatened by spirits or really believe that he is around anymore. But who knows? I sage and cleanse my place almost daily and feel it to be a safe and light space. I will say that there is still so much I don't know when it comes to all of those incidents. About 10 years ago, I moved into a new home in Indiana with three roommates. I won't go into too much detail about where the home is located out of respect for my former roommates, one of which still lives there. I will say that it is located in a very old part of town, a few blocks off of one of the very first main roads that used to be in the town that was settled in 1846, I believe. Anyway, this house was definitely not what comes to mind when you picture a haunted house. It was built sometime in the early 80s or early 90s. It was pretty ordinary looking. Three bedrooms with a small loft area, tiny bathrooms, and not a whole lot of room for four adults to spread out. But when you're a college student in your early 20s and have the opportunity to split rent four ways, this seemed perfect. We had all our own tiny little spaces, shared a kitchen and living room, and spent most of our time just bullshitting around the dining room table. The house was owned by an older couple who lived in a city about 20 minutes away. They began renting the home out to help finance their retirement. They were sweet and pretty relaxed on any rules for the home. They told us right off the bat that they were not physically fit enough to do any maintenance or repairs on the house should anything go wrong, so we were told to call them with any issues and they would send over their handyman or whichever professional was needed. They never came to the house. Not once. We paid rent by money order through the mail. I didn't find this strange at the time. The first weird event occurred about a week after we all moved in. 
We all worked the night shift at our respective jobs, so the house was empty all night and we arrived home around the same time early in the morning. We dragged ass into the living room to enjoy some sort of fast food breakfast before passing out when we realized that the entire carpet downstairs was soaked. A pipe had burst beneath our dishwasher during the night and flooded the kitchen, dining room, and living room. Our landlords had the floor replaced within a week, and we went on with our lives. Then, about a week later, we were baking cookies in the oven when all of a sudden the cookies burst into flames. The oven was producing so much heat that I was afraid that the whole thing would catch on fire. The landlord sent a repairman who told us that something had caused the internal thermometer in the oven to be so uncalibrated that you could set the oven temp to 300 degrees, but it would be more like 475 in there. Again, we had it fixed and moved on. It wasn't long after that when the unexplainable and unnerving activity began. The ceiling fans in the rooms would turn on randomly and they would spin so hard that they would rattle and shake to the point that it looked like the thing was about to fly off of the ceiling. Every room was equipped with button switches. There are four buttons on the wall, one for the light and the other three for various speeds for the fan. The fan would make a two-tone chiming noise when you would push the button to turn it on. No one would be able to turn on a fan without pretty much everyone in the house hearing this chime. We were creeped out, but chalked it up to faulty wiring or a power surge. That chime still haunts my dreams. Then came the TV issue. We all pulled together to buy a large flat screen TV for our living room, brand new, name brand, extra warranty. The TV would turn on by itself constantly. We returned it to the store, exchanging it for a new one, and thought it would be fine. We would be outside or in a different room and hear the chime, go turn the fan off, and realize that the TV had just turned itself on. This happened five or six times a day. It was unable to be ignored. Two separate things in two different rooms turning on almost simultaneously. The electrician was called. He found no signs of faulty wiring, and I think he thought we were making it up. After months of this, we began to hear the whistling. Three notes whistled by an unseen force at all times during the day. This would usually happen when you were in a room by yourself. I would get this sick, anxious feeling like I was being watched, and right then, I would hear the whistle. Someone or something wanted our attention and he got it. Three of us were totally convinced that our house was haunted. Our other roommate was a skeptic and also pretty much had to make this living situation work or he would be sleeping in his car. About a year and a half of living in this house, dealing with constant phenomena, it ramped up again. We would be in the kitchen making dinner, go eat in the living room, and come back to find every cabinet door open. Sometimes the refrigerator and oven doors were open too. This happened probably three or four times a week, on top of all the other crap. I was over it, but had no idea how to fix it. I went to Borders Bookstore and got a few books about ghosts and hauntings and different information about getting rid of the creepies in one's home. I decided to do a smudging, and I could not have been more sorry about that decision. We planned to do all the sage smudging together, and our Catholic roommate also had his priest come in and do a house blessing that same day. Holy oil and water were sprinkled in each room, the smell of white sage burning. We thought it was over. The next morning, I was walking downstairs like I had a million times before, when my feet completely flew out from under me and I was airborne. I remember thinking, this isn't possible, right before I smashed into the stairs. I landed on my back, right at the edge of them. Picture Lucy pulling the football away before Charlie Brown can kick it, and his tiny feet are kicking in the air. I was Charlie Brown. I landed not on my butt or side, but squarely on my thoracic spine, the upper area of my spine. How on earth did I defy gravity? I had now tripped. I was barefoot on carpeted stairs, sober, and holding the railing. I didn't feel a push. I felt a sweeping force take my legs out from under me. 
I broke four vertebra in my back, about parallel with my shoulder blades. I've had injections and nerve damage and back braces and a chronic pain that isn't normal for someone in their 20s. I began to look for a new place to live. I found out that I was pregnant with my son about two months later and decided that the risk was too great to live in that house pregnant, so I packed up that night, told my roommates that I would continue to pay my portion of the rent until our lease was up, and moved back in with my parents. I was only staying with my parents for about a month before finding a new safe place for my baby, my now husband, and I. But I lived constantly on edge thinking, what if it followed me? It didn't. What did follow me are the nightmares where I relive the feeling of terror and dread washing over me, and every so often, I can still hear the whistle. I swear up and down that this story, as much as it sounds like it's a made-up, run-of-the-mill scary doll story, it is 100% true and still terrifies me. When I was a kid, I would spend a lot of time in Texas with my brother and stepmom, mainly just my brother and stepmom because my dad was in the military, and would frequently go on long trips leaving us alone in whatever house that we happened to be living at at the time. When I was about five, we moved to a very large, old Victorian house. It had three stories, not including the attic and the basement, lots of rooms, and as a little kid I found it was very fun to explore. In the attic, there was a ton of old junk that the owner of the house was storing while we were renting it, including a huge collection of beautiful handcrafted porcelain dolls. There were hundreds of them lined up neatly on the back wall in a glass case, standing on their little stands like an army ready for command, and as a little girl who loved ribbons and bows and anything girly, I was entranced. One doll in particular stood out to me. It had beautiful red hair, it was a green-eyed doll in a blue silk dress with a matching ribbon. I begged my dad to let me play with her. I felt like I needed to hold and love her and have tea parties with her. He of course refused, saying that the dolls were worth more than I could imagine and that he wanted his deposit back when we moved. He kept the door locked for good measure after catching me more than once staring in awe at the doll. A month went by and I had all but forgotten about her, choosing to simply explore the house and play in my basement room with my Barbies. That is until one day when I came home from dropping my dad off at the base and found the red-haired doll sitting on my bed. I was ecstatic, thinking that my dad had given me the doll and left it as a surprise, so I proceeded to play with the doll every second of every day until my dad came home. As soon as my dad saw the doll, he flipped out and yelled at me, spanked me, and took the doll away to lock back up in the basement and only got more aggravated when he discovered that the attic door was still locked and he was the only one to have the key. He couldn't figure out how I could have possibly picked the lock and re-picked the lock to lock it back. His solution was that I had somehow convinced my brother to do it for me. Another month went by and my dad installed another lock on the attic, warning me and my brother what would happen if he found out that we had been in there again while he was gone. That very night, when we returned home, the doll sat on my bed again, leaving me wary of its presence. Something that had once made me so happy now made me cautious and anxious. I told my stepmom, who immediately became angry and slapped me and then my brother, and tried to return the doll, only to find the attic door, once again, locked. She tore the house apart, trying to find the keys that she was positive we had hidden until giving up and locking the doll in her room. The night my dad came home, I was terrified. He wouldn't speak to me or my brother at all. He only gave a short speech about how we needed to go to our rooms and not come out. The next trip he made, we didn't see him off to the base. We sat in our rooms and had a quiet evening alone. I spent the night sulking and trying to figure out how the doll had gotten back into my room. Later, after I had fallen asleep, I heard soft music box sounds that slowly woke me up. I felt something near my feet, and thinking it was my cat curled up, I reached down, only to find, instead of fur, a handful of hair. I turned on my light and screamed. What looked like every doll from the attic was in my room. 
They were sitting at my tea table on my dollhouse and positioned in standing position on my bed and in various parts of my room. My door slammed open and my dad appeared in the doorway where he had apparently been waiting for me to head to the attic to claim a doll. He took one look at them, grabbed me, and ran out of the house, dragging my brother and stepmom along with us. He refuses to speak of them to this day. The most important part of the story is the backstory of the red-haired doll. Apparently, the original builder and owner of the house had a daughter who died when she was about eight, and it was customary to make a doll of their likeness made out of their real hair and dressed in the same clothes that the child had worn. I think it was that little girl, because I have never felt like it was dangerous to play with the doll. I just felt like she was lonely and wanted to make a friend. I work night shift on a unit at a nursing home. I hear and see a lot of weird things, but nothing much with meaning. Me and the other aide were walking down my hall to go check on a fall risk resident when we got in front of the door to an empty room that stays locked. The resident had moved home and no one had been in there since mid-October. I heard three distinct knocks coming from inside the room on the door as soon as we walked by. I froze and turned around, and without speaking looked at my friend, waiting for her to say if she had heard it as well, and when she did, I was frozen in fear, knowing that I was not alone in hearing things. Lots of little extra things have also happened. Me and another aide walked by a room when we got bad vibes. It was cracked open an inch, and the door slammed shut suddenly, so hard that it shook the floor. Right next to the room with the knocks, we had a resident pass away. Again, me and an aide walked by, the door was closed and locked, and the handle started jiggling hard and fast. Another time, me and an aide heard snarling growls coming from the dining room all night. The same night when the knocks occurred. There were also instances of running faucets in the residents' bathrooms, in the basement, anywhere that I went, had a resident complaining of water running all night. I have always been interested in the paranormal and going ghost hunting, as me and my friends called it. This story takes place on an October night in 2005. We had gathered at my dad's house for a party. We lived way out in the country, in an old farmhouse. We decided to drive up the road to an old cemetery because one of my friends showed up with a Ouija board. I said we weren't going to use it at my house, but I was game to use it somewhere else. About six of us piled into different vehicles and took off. When we got there, we set the Ouija board up on an old concrete barrier that surrounded the entrance of the cemetery. For context, the cemetery was set on a hill surrounded by cow pastures, fields, and trees. Across the road stood an old, white church. There were two security lights that lit the church area and the entrance to the cemetery. There was one more security light that lit the field next to the only house for about two miles. We all stood in a circle, planchette in the centers, hands all on it. My friend led the seance and asked if there was anything in the cemetery with us. At first nothing happened and we all stood still and quiet. Then the planchette slowly moved toward yes. Immediately we all started accusing each other of moving it, but everyone swore that they didn't. An eerie feeling fell over us as the planchette moved back to the center of the board. About that time, we heard what sounded like wind initially, but began to get closer. It sounded like the footsteps of multiple people running in circles all around us. We were all wide-eyed, looking at each other when someone said, I'm out. Another person said, we have to tell it by or the spirits will follow. The leader of the group spoke to the board and said something along the lines of, We are saying goodbye to you, 
and the planchette quickly jerked to no. It was pretty obvious by how shocked we all were that none of us had done that. Mind you, the sound of the footsteps are still surrounding us. The planchette moves to the center and we say bye again. Again, it moves to no, then back to the center. This time we all say it together, my friend's idea. And slowly, agonizingly slowly, moved the planchette to the word goodbye. We were relieved and took off running to the cars, which were parked at the entrance of the cemetery on the side of the road. Me and a buddy jump into my truck, and I hear my friend scream something about not being able to find their keys. She checks the ignition, her pockets. All our friends check the car and their pockets. No keys. Everyone else loads back into the truck, and we speed the three miles down the road to my dad's house. My friend searches her purse and pockets for the keys again, and again we couldn't find them anywhere. Eventually, someone takes her home, and she says she'll get her spare and get a ride back to her car in the morning. We were all too scared to go back and look that night. The next day, my friend searches the cemetery and never finds the keys, even in broad daylight. We hadn't walked around a whole lot, and where we used the Ouija board was very close to where we had parked our cars. Me and several friends scoured the entire cemetery over the next week or so and never did find them. My friend said she was 100% positive that they were left in the ignition when she got out of the car. It's where I left mine, and a common practice in the area where I'm from, which, like I said, is pretty rural. This was by far my scariest, but not the only Ouija board experience that I have. So about 15 years ago, I was living with my ex-girlfriend, my sister, and her husband in an old house not far from town. Within the first few weeks of living there, strange things were happening regularly. Lights going out randomly, noises upstairs. At one point, one of the windows at the back of the house was cut. Like someone had went in with glass cutters trying to break in, but gave up on it and left. Creepy stuff like that. That was bad enough, but things got pretty severe as time went on. One week in particular was truly insane. The first thing that happened that week was on a Tuesday night. Everyone was working, and I was home alone watching TV when I noticed that our cat was acting really weird, backed into a corner, and arched up as though she was scared. When I went to get up, the electricity went out in the house, and it was pitch black inside. The second that happened, I heard really loud footsteps running down the stairs toward me. I got up and braced myself for whatever it was, but there was nothing. I gathered myself and went outside to the front garden to check if the other house's lights were on, but my house was the only one that was dark. I went to the fuse box to reset the trip switch, and all was back to normal. A few days later, I think it was a Tuesday, we were all sitting in the living room watching a movie and eating a pizza. The lights were on, there was a good atmosphere in the house, when out of nowhere, a massive bang happened upstairs. We go up to check it out, and I went into our bedroom and saw that my bedside table was in the middle of the room. But the worst and last thing that happened to me was on a Saturday night. I'll never forget this. It still gives me chills when I think about it. We go to bed. Everything's normal. We watch a bit of a movie and fall asleep. I wake up facing the wall and glance at the alarm clock. It reads 3.13 a.m. I turned over to go back to sleep and saw my ex standing in the center of the room. Confused, I begin to sit up and ask her what's wrong, but as I start to sit up, I realize my ex is asleep in bed next to me. A surge of fear runs through my core, and I'm frozen to the spot. My eyes adjust, and I just barely make out the figure. It was a young girl in a nightdress with a cartoon character on it, soaking wet, with her head looking down at the floor. I could hear the water droplets landing on the carpet, and I'm just sitting there totally in shock, unable to believe my eyes. 
After a couple of seconds, her apparition melted away and faded out of sight. I got up and turned on the lights and tried to tell myself that it was just a night terror or something. But the problem with that was that there was a wet patch where she had been standing. We moved out shortly after that. But I can still picture her to this day. Creepiest thing I've ever experienced. Okay, so this has happened two times that we noticed. The first time was three months ago. At 2 a.m., my husband was playing an Xbox game. Name of the game was Halo. So it was only my husband. My kids were asleep upstairs, and I was down in the basement in our room in bed. I was reading. He told me that he was on the couch. The game was paused, since he was looking in his phone for a cheat or something for it. By the stairs, he clearly heard, Mommy, my daughter doesn't call me like this. But they were asleep. He even checked. This was yesterday. At 5 p.m., I was coloring in the living room. The TV was on a Parking Wars episode, and my kids were upstairs playing a game. The hubby was outside mowing the yard. I clearly heard, Mommy? Mommy, Mommy! Clearly a little girl, and it sounded like it was behind me, not where my kids would be. And it was not my daughter's voice. Now today, I was folding clothes and had small hand towels by me. I watched as they were pushed off of the couch and away from me. Not like they would if they had just fallen down. When I was younger, my mama would leave me home alone with my older brothers. As soon as she would leave, they would pull out a hidden Ouija board and play around on it. Of course, I wasn't allowed to be part of the game. I was probably around six or seven, and they were in their late teens. I can remember so vividly these memories. Mama left, and the boys went into a bedroom off the kitchen where the board was hidden. They closed the door behind them, and I was left watching cartoons by myself in the living room. The bedroom door had a gap under it, about an inch and a half tall, and I would sometimes quietly go lay on the floor and watch them play with it through the gap. I can remember them making contact with a spirit one night, and they asked its name, to which it replied, Tobias. Each time they played after that, it always seemed to be Tobias reaching out. For about a week, they conversed with this spirit, and nothing out of the ordinary seemed to come from it. However, one night, as I was watching them, the board started talking about me. My brothers would always write down the things being communicated and read them aloud, which made it easy for me to eavesdrop on them. As I lay there on the kitchen floor looking under the door, the game became active and my brother started writing. I saw both of them make eye contact and look at each other, confused. My oldest brother said, It said we are being watched? As they looked around the room, I snuck back to my cartoons. They opened the door and checked on me, then went back into the room. I crept back over to watch some more. This time, the board used my name. I recall my brother saying, It says Bianca needs to go away. I could feel the blood leave my face. I knew my brothers hadn't seen me watching. I got up and pretended to be sleeping on the couch, and eventually just actually did fall asleep there. I was awoken in the middle of the night by a strange sound. Kind of like the sound a cat makes in its throat when it's mad. I sat up and cleaned the sleep from my eyes. After sitting there in the dark for a moment, it seemed to go quiet in the house. I was getting ready to get up and go to the bathroom, but I felt unable to stand. Almost like something was pushing down on my shoulders. 
Then suddenly it was like I was in a wind tunnel. I remember Mama's sheer curtains were whirling around and it felt like they filled the room. I felt so dizzy and then it just stopped. I don't remember going to sleep at all, but I woke up on the same couch and it was daylight outside. I have never spoken about this to anyone, but the story doesn't end there. My brothers continued to mess around with the board, which I was no longer wanting to be around. It got to the point that weird things were happening to them, too. They would talk about it amongst themselves and I would play oblivious. One night, my brothers walked out of the bedroom with a rolled-up sheet and scissors. They told me that they would be right back and walked out the door. The next morning, I learned that the board had said some things that really frightened them. They took it down the road to the old iron bridge near our house to cut it up and throw it over into the water. We were all sitting in the kitchen eating breakfast when we heard a loud crash outside. We ran out to see a car had wrecked on the bridge. My brothers were sure it was because of the Ouija spirit that they thought they had disposed of the night before. The person who wrecked happened to be a person that my brother went to school with. He told my brother that he wrecked because as he was driving over the bridge, a demon-like figure appeared next to him in the car. He later found a piece of the board in his car and nobody knows how it got there. Ever since I was a kid, I had paranormal experiences. One intense rule of the house my mom gave me was never to participate in a Ouija board. When I was 14 years old, I'm now 20, I let my curiosity get the best of me and decided to do a Ouija board with a friend. In my room in the complete dark, we began the process. To my surprise, nothing happened. Later that night, I let my mind and fear get the best of me and decided to sleep with my mom, who had no clue that I had previously participated in a Ouija board, otherwise she would have killed me. As I was falling asleep, my mom asleep right next to me, I saw the silhouette of a large man in the doorway. At first, I told myself that it was just my brother. I called his name twice, then noticed that this figure was at least six inches taller than my brother and completely unresponsive to what I was saying. I started to panic and pray as I realized that this was not my brother and perhaps something far more evil that I had invited into the house. I was too afraid to move or to wake my mom. After about five minutes, though it felt like ten years, the figure disappeared. I struggled to sleep for the rest of the night. The next morning, I was getting ready with my mom in the bathroom. Keep in mind that she has no idea what I had seen in her room last night, or even that I had done the Ouija board. She brings up to me a nightmare that she had had the previous night. After I asked her to tell me, the answer brought me to tears. She said that there was a demonic entity in the hallway, and as she went to touch it, it threw her across the room. As I broke down in tears and told her the truth, we proceeded to bless our house. I will never do a Ouija board again. I'm not saying we have a ghost, spook, or spirit. But something phenomenological is definitely happening in our home. The brief background on the home is that it's over 70 years old in an older part of our town. The previous resident was a well-respected attorney in the area and he died here. We wouldn't learn this until after we moved in. The house was almost completely dismantled and rebuilt with new everything. Paint, electric, plumbing, drywall, etc. One floor, not a whole lot of square footage. An attic that has about two and a half feet of clearance. Not long after getting moved in, my wife and I learned a little bit more about the house's history and that the previous owner had passed away and that it was quite some time after his death before he was discovered. We made peace with this information and continued settling in. 
The first peculiar incident wasn't really that peculiar. It had been well over a year since the previous owner passed, but he kept receiving mail. A lot of mail. Fun mail, too. Magazines and newspapers with the subscriptions renewing. We remarked on the mail as being merely interesting, and for the sake of creating a tradition, we always kept the old attorney's mail for a day or two in case he just wanted to read it. Eventually, this would trickle to a stop. The second peculiar incident caught our attention. After two months of being in the house, we decided to get newer, better locks for the doors. I had a new key. My wife had a new key. Two extra keys went on the key hook. A few days go by, and my wife asked me if I had lost my key or if I had trouble locking or unlocking the door. I hadn't. She showed me the two extra keys. Both were still on the wire ring, and both had bends of about 15 degrees right at the key shoulder. We agreed that this was odd, but we let it go with some loose rationalizations. The third peculiar incident started a little over two years ago and continues still. Neither I nor my wife smoke. However, about once every two weeks on a random day and usually after midnight, the distinct odor of warm cigarette smoke can be smelled in our living room. At first, we thought it was someone walking nearby, or a neighbor, or an odd or unfortunate combination of smells from a garbage can. We got some cameras and pointed them outside to see what we could see. Nothing. The last time we smelled cigarettes was about two weeks ago. And we've had electricians check our wiring on unrelated matters just in case. The fourth incident relates to the second. Two metal spoons in the silverware drawer were bent almost snapped. Aside from the cigarette smoke, it's been a while since anything has happened until last week. For whatever reason, the attorney's mail is resumed and the fifth peculiar incident has occurred. I work out in the woods, and my wife now works from home in the company of our two cats. In a flurry of texts and phone calls, she told me that it sounded like someone was running around upstairs as if they were rushing across the house to answer the phone, was how she described it. We've had squirrels in our useless attic and the occasional tree branch. The footsteps exceeded both of those. The sixth and most recent peculiar incident is equal parts mundane and intriguing. We have a favorite spatula. Yes, we do. Some of you reading this probably have your own favorite spatula, spoon, fork, pot, pan, as well. We used the bright robin's egg blue utensil to make our Thanksgiving dinner and set it aside with the rest of the cooking detritus. That evening and the following morning, the kitchen is cleaned and everything is put away. Sunday began the greater holiday baking season, requiring the favorite spatula. Except it was missing. The ceramic container where the utensils are stored has everything else. Red things, green things, metal things, wooden things. Visual inspection of the surrounding area results in zilch. Every cupboard and drawer opened and investigated to nothing. We sadly conclude that after the big cleanup, it must have ended up in the trash. So we began an online hunt for its replacement. On Friday last, I get a picture of the utensils sitting quite happily amongst all the others. I was confused by this since the evening before we had to use other tools instead of the missing spatula because it was missing. So, sometime after 9.30 p.m. Thursday and 7.18 a.m. on Friday, something that was missing for at least five days returned. So, here it is in order. 1. A confluence of strange coincidences. 2. Sleepwalking. 3. Someone is managing to live in our attic. 4. That I and my wife are in a weirdly mutual prank cycle. Or 5. Something real is happening. If you have any ideas, tests, solutions, resources, or suggestions, I'm listening. Nothing seems malvoyant about what's been happening, but it's definitely happening.
I live in Oklahoma, and I'm really big into finding abandoned places and exploring them. I found out a few months ago that there is a forgotten graveyard a few minutes away from my house. I've lived in Oklahoma my whole life, and I've never even heard anyone mention this place before. So I looked it up and did more research on it to make sure that I wasn't walking into something crazy or where I could possibly be harmed. I found out that it was the site of an old schoolhouse, and that there was no marker, so people had basically just forgotten that it was even there over the years unless they had a loved one that was buried there. I waited until daylight to go, just in case, because I wanted to be able to see everything around me since I was in the middle of nowhere. I ended up asking my sister if she wanted to go with me so that I wouldn't be alone. And God, am I glad that I asked her to come because I never thought I would have saw what I did. We woke early the next morning to go before it got hot because it was summertime. It was ten minutes away from the house, so it was an easy drive. Finding the exact location was the hard part. Once we did find it, we pulled up and got out and started to look around. The grass was all overgrown, and you couldn't really see any of the headstones anymore. We had to be super careful walking around because we didn't want to step on anyone. We explored for about an hour or so, and then we stumbled upon this opening where the old schoolhouse used to be. All of a sudden, out of nowhere, it sounded like someone or something was running right at us. But there was no one else around. And mind you, again, we're in the middle of nowhere. So we stop what we're doing and back up a bit to look and see. Neither of us spook easy, so we just looked around and we didn't see anything. We decided it was getting too hot to just stand out there for much longer, and so we started walking back to the car. Again, it sounded like something or someone was running at us, but faster this time. We both took off sprinting to the car and didn't stop until we got in and locked the doors. As we sat there, I looked up more about this place, and it's known by a few people to have major activity, and it's so bad that they actually tell you not to go at night time. I read stories of people who said they had seen figures walking around, or someone asking them for help and then disappearing a few minutes later. I'm glad that I decided to wait until daylight, and that I asked my sister to come with me, because I don't know what I would have done if I heard someone that I couldn't even see running at me if I were alone. I've never been back to this graveyard. It actually kind of scares me to even think about going back after what happened when, though it wasn't anything serious like some of the other stuff people had said happened to them, maybe one day I'll have the guts to return. At my dad's house, I had this red-headed porcelain Victorian type of china doll with a green velvet dress. I was there for a couple of weeks as opposed to a couple of days, which was usually the case, because I was like 11, so I had no job and it was summer. This doll was always on the far end of my dresser, facing away from my bed. My room was set up with my headboard against the wall with the window, and the dresser was really long and ran along the same window wall. I honestly never really liked the doll. It always felt like it was angry. I don't even remember when I got it. I want to say it was from my stepmom's mom, or maybe from a garage sale. Both are likely since my stepmom's mom is Dutch and has a huge collection of weird baby dolls. None of them China though. But my stepmom also is a huge lover of all things garage sale. Like I said, I was there for a few days, this time a couple weeks. It didn't really bother me. The only thing that freaked me the hell out was a Furby that spoke without batteries. But then, all the weird stuff started. I've always slept with my door shut, and if there's an option, locked. I used to have nightmares about witches coming into my room, casting a spell on me, then leaving without me ever knowing. So if I didn't have the option of a lock, I would put something behind the door so that I would know if it was opened as I slept. Unfortunately, I did have a lock on my door, but I wasn't allowed to use it, so I always just put a couple socks behind the door. One morning, I woke up, and the doll was turned toward me instead of away. 
I thought nothing of it, figuring that I had probably just bumped it, especially since the socks weren't moved. Again the next morning, it was a couple inches closer to my bed. I have always been a believer in the supernatural, so I was trying really hard not to get scared, especially since I'd had this doll for a while and it had never done anything sketchy. The next morning, it was almost falling off the edge of the dresser it was so close to me. I checked the socks. They hadn't been moved, so no one had come into my room. I threw her into a pile of clothes face down in my closet. The next morning, I checked the socks. Again, they hadn't moved, but when I checked the doll, she was facing up. Needless to say, it creeped me right the hell out. So, being the lovely older sister that I was, I gave it to my little sister, who would have been about four at the time. The next day, she brought it back to me saying, I don't like it, it's angry, or something along those lines. I sat with this doll on my bed for a while, thinking, what do I do? I've got this doll that probably wants to murder me, but I can't throw it out because it's good quality and my parents are huge skeptics, and I finally decided that if it's angry, maybe it was because nobody was nice to it. So I took a Barbie brush and started brushing out all of her knots and frizz and tried to get some of the ringlets back to her hair. I cleaned the dirt off of her face, I straightened her dress, all that. I put her on my dresser afterward, and for six years, nothing happened until, on one of the weekends when I was at my dad's, my sister asked if she could have it because it was pretty, quote-unquote. I guess she forgot the one time she did have it. I got a call a few days later from my dad, letting me know that my sister had thrown my doll out of her second floor window and broke it. The next time I was there, I asked her why, and she told me that every time she woke up, that the doll was somewhere different from where it was when she had gone to bed. I bought an old antique Asian chest about 15 years ago. It was really lovely. I moved in with my parents while I was in college into the guest house out back. There was no room in the tiny cottage for the chest, so my mom had me put it in the walkway between the back of the house where my young brothers slept and the living room. Everyone, and I mean everyone, hated that piece of furniture. They'd scurry past it as fast as they could to get wherever they were going. Occasionally we would hear knocking or a random door that would just open. One morning, my brother Justin and I left and went to run errands and go shopping. When we came back six hours later, my mom was raking leaves in the front yard. When we got out of the car, mom asked, Wait, when did you come get Justin? We told her that we had been gone all day. She said, No, you haven't. I just saw him two hours ago. I assumed he'd gone to his bedroom to play video games. I told her that we had been gone since early that morning, and she kept insisting that there was no way. He walked past her. She had said hi to him. She said that he didn't respond to her, but she figured that he had been on a mission to get to his room. When I asked her where she saw him, she said that she was vacuuming in the hallway in front of the chest. I ended up giving it to my older brother, who said that he would hear my nieces laughing and playing in the hallway of his apartment. He said one morning he got up to see the youngest run down the hall into her room, but when he got to her room, she wasn't in there. He threw it out. I wish he hadn't, and I wish that I knew where it was now. I work at a mental health facility. Strange things happen a lot, like doors closing and opening, seeing things out of the corner of your eye, you know, normal creepy hospital stuff. Well, I had the creepiest experience. One night about a year ago, I'm working on the adolescent unit, night shift. I just saw something move out of the corner of my eye. Then immediately afterward, this girl comes running out of her room, screaming that the devil comes at 3.33. She's just repeating it over and over again. We get her some meds, and she goes back to sleep. 
The next night, it happens again. This time I look back at the clock, and it is in fact 3.33. They don't have clocks in their rooms, and they can't have watches, so there's no way that she knew what time that it was. We played back the camera, and she just went from dead asleep to balls to the wall. So this girl does this every single night for her entire stay, which was about five days. During that time, the quote-unquote creepy hospital stuff seemed to happen even more. Random door buzzers were going off, doors were opening and closing, lights were flickering, that creepy being watched, hair sticking up on your neck feeling was happening all the time. Every day she would say that she didn't remember getting up and had no idea what we were talking about. About a week afterward, she got transferred to a long-term facility. I get called to receive a report for a patient that was being sent to us. I'm reading through the notes, and at the very end, quote-unquote, parents report patient repeatedly says that the devil comes at 3.33. I check the name to see if it's the same girl. It wasn't. I called the on-call physician, and he immediately declined the patient. To this day, all the staff have no idea what happened. I will preface this by saying that I think I'm silly to believe in ghosts, and I get embarrassed to speak about it. The alternative to believing that I was haunted is admitting that I am much more mentally ill than I had ever believed, which is absolutely possible. This took place over a few years in a farmhouse in the desert of Arizona. It was newly developed land. We moved into the place when I was 15. At the time, I was going through a lot emotionally and smoking a lot of weed. That might explain some of my personal experiences, so I'll try not to dwell on them too much. The house was set up almost plantation style. It was very wide, had a big wraparound porch, and lots of awkward corners. The front room was a tall library with an open balcony to the upstairs, which ran into long, skinny bedrooms. My parents' room was closest to the stairs and was attached to a nursery with a sliding ensuite door. My brother's rooms, who were two years younger than me, and my room were at the end of a dark hallway. That side of the house never got sun, so it had bad vibes all around. Downstairs, there was a messed up Harry Potter style closet, a sunken in living room, a kitchen in the center of the house, and a sunken playroom for the baby. It honestly started the first day that we moved in. My brother and I were the only ones in the house, and we were unboxing plates. It was so empty that everything in there echoed. I swear it sounded like a little girl laughed, like a creepy track that you could get off of a nap or something. Keep in mind, the TVs were not plugged in. We were on an acre of land, far away from the dirt road, and my brother was way too stupid to pull a prank like that. I started hearing voices at night. This wasn't unusual. I honestly used to freak myself out so badly that I think I made noises up to scare myself. My parents had raised me not to talk about things scaring me, to tough it out and be a big girl. It was fine most of the time during the day. Everything bad came at night. I remember distinctly when it started messing with me in bed. In solidarity, my brother and I kept our bedroom doors open for the hallway's nightlight, and in case we needed to call for each other. We had a pretty messed up childhood that might have contributed to all the codependency I'll describe during this. I was falling asleep, but not quite out. I felt the blanket slipping off the bed and reached down to grab it. This was common. I didn't have a bed frame with a foot. It kept slipping no matter how I tried to tuck it. In classic horror movie fashion, the last time I pulled it, I felt tension. There was nothing it could have been caught on. I felt like the second I went from confused to terrified, it bounced back to me. I don't know how to explain this that well, but I was certain that someone was under the bed pulling it away from me. 
Later, I moved another nightlight into the bedroom. It was a kind of spooky amber-orange, and I convinced my parents to let me paint the walls cherry red. Again, I was almost asleep, but not quite out, so I don't think it could have been sleep paralysis. I heard the carpet rustle, and maybe joints cracking. It sounded like my mom had come in to check on me. I opened my eyes, and immediately froze. I don't think I've ever been more scared in my life. There was a woman crawling across my floor from the far side of my room to the foot of my bed. She was pale and stringy-haired as if she were going bald. I couldn't see her face. I don't know how I fell asleep. I couldn't scream or move. I think she disappeared under my bed. But again, this could always be a hallucination. My baby brother was about seven months old when she started coming out during the day. My mom was a teacher at the time and was able to stay home with us during summer vacation. It was lunchtime and we were watching a movie quietly downstairs while the baby napped. There were noises upstairs, as if something had been dropped to the ground. We listened for a second before my mom ran up. She thought the baby had fallen out of his crib. We opened the door and found him sound asleep. There was weird white stuff on the floor. It took us a while to figure out that it was drywall or something like that. There was a crawl space to a small attic where the AC and insulation could be reached. It was barely big enough to get into and a good nine feet from the ground. It also had to be pushed up and slid over to open. There was a visible gap. The carpet was a really ugly dark blue, so we could see the white spots on the ground as if something had been dragged from one side of the room to where the crib was, and it stopped right in front of it. My mom checked the closet and called my stepdad. He couldn't leave work, so we stayed downstairs until he got home and checked the crawl space. We have never had animals. It's really difficult for most things to live in Arizona, so wildlife is pretty rare in that area. He didn't find anything, or signs of anything living up there. This happened every other day for two weeks. We really didn't know what to make of it. My mom thought it might be the AC suctioning the opening upward. It stopped and didn't happen again for two and a half years, until my baby sister was born and stayed in the same crib. Again, it happened on and off for a few weeks, and never again. To keep my own solo experiences brief, I had a period of three months where I straight up did not sleep. I went crazy. Every night, I felt like my bed was shaking. The instant I laid my head down, it would vibrate, the metal frame would sway, and I would feel as if something was pushing the mattress between the baseboards or sitting on the corner. I had my brother touch the frame one night to tell me if the shaking was in my head or not. He said it wasn't, but I'm still not sure if he wasn't just playing into it. I thought I might be having seizures or something. At one point I got so frustrated I started sleeping on the couch downstairs with the dog. I started hearing whispers too. Not a noise that sounded odd, but someone calling my name. My name has three freaking syllables. I would be in my room, door open, doing something at night after my parents went to bed. It was a female voice, but it sounded off. I don't know how to explain it. The downstairs really scared me after the lights went out, so I never went down, but I did walk to the balcony and look. I never saw anything, but the whispering would stop when I got close. My brother started hearing it too. He's kind of weird. His life's dream has been enlisting in the army, so his reaction was always getting his knife and walking right downstairs to confront it. He would turn the lights on and look around before coming right back up. He slept on my floor a few nights because he was convinced that she wanted me. We had prior haunting experiences, which led to my parents making jokes that the ghosts follow us. They didn't pay much attention to it at the time when it was quiet. One night, my parents went out with the babies. My brother and I were in our rooms, doors open per usual. We started hearing something strange. At first, I thought it was the wind. 
It got louder until it was clear that a woman was wailing. I know it sounds crazy, but it was so clear. We hid in my room for what felt like hours, calling my mom. For some reason, it never occurred to us to call the police. Eventually, the crying stopped. We hatched a plan to run for the stairs and out the nearest door. All of the lights were on in the house, and my brother has his stupid knives. It's like it knew that we were going to leave. We heard shuffling outside the door, and maybe breathing? I guess it could have been the air conditioning. We kind of decided that we were ready to die, unlocked the door, and booked it. The crying started again, and it was very clear that it was coming from my parents' room. We stood outside the property line for another hour, waiting for them to arrive, watching the house. No one could have gotten out without us seeing. We had huge windows lining the upstairs hallway that showed everything with the lights on. My parents again made fun of us, and still do about that night. A few other incidents include my baby brother talking to the man upstairs. He would stand in front of the balcony and chat up to someone. He told us that the man was hiding in my room. He talked about the man in the window and would ask, Who's that? Directed to the doors at night. I don't want to talk about all of it, but there were so many instances of voices, doors slamming, and things being knocked over in my room that I really did think I was losing my mind. I moved out at 18 and came back occasionally, usually to babysit. Apparently, my reluctant believer mother and absolute skeptic stepdad watched a coffee pot jump off of the counter. They were also outside sitting and having an open fire while drinking coffee when they saw a figure in the balcony window of our room. It was a tall man, but my stepdad still needed urging to go upstairs. It appeared a second time, closer to where the nursery door was. My mom said she had horrible dreams about a man in the corner of her room after that. She was present for many of the instances where we heard footsteps upstairs, door slamming when the AC was off, etc. But she always denied that there was anything wrong. Once my parents left town with the kids for a week. At this point I was 19 and living happily an hour away. My mom begged me to check on my brother and stay a few nights for the weekend. I arrived during the evening after I got off of work. I asked how had things been when he was alone. He said he was fine, he just didn't go upstairs at night and, quote-unquote, minded his business. He said if he ignored it and tried not to get scared, then it in return ignored him. He felt safe with the dog. We were watching YouTube and eating when we started to hear a deep noise. At first I thought it was a bike or one of the small buggies that people drove out here. Then I noticed that it was holding a tune. It was humming. The dog had a weird thing about staring into the bathroom if the door was open, which is scary at night. This time, the door was closed, and he still stood up and stared. The noise was so deep that it sounded as if it couldn't have been human, but it was definitely melodic. There's nothing I could think to figure out to try and explain it. My brother and I just kind of looked at each other. Then, a door slammed upstairs and we decided to nope out of there and go for a walk. When we got back, I decided that I would sleep in my parents' room. It didn't feel right to stay in the kids' room, but looking back, it would have been best to stay close to my brother. I fell asleep surprisingly easy. I guess about two hours passed before my brother slammed the door open. The house smelled like it was burning. Not really like a fire smell, but more like burning plastic and trash. I was panicked. I was the adult and had no idea what to do in that situation. We checked the house. I turned off the air conditioning, thinking it might be on fire. We opened all the windows and fell asleep on the couches downstairs. The next day, the smell was still lingering, but less overwhelming. The air conditioner was fine when I turned it back on. Like usual, the day was fine. That next night, my brother and I went on a jack-in-the-box run. It might have taken 30 minutes. We arrived home to a mess of blood, vomit, and shit. 
The dog was sick all over the living room. We immediately took him to an emergency vet, certain that he was dying. They checked him for everything that they could and gave him a clean bill. When we got home, all hell broke loose. My brother and I were cleaning up the mess with the doors open for airflow. There were absolutely insane banging noises coming from upstairs. We hadn't locked up on the way out. My brother thought that someone had snuck in and was trashing the place. He went up to check and I hung out downstairs ready to call the cops if need be. Nothing happened. Nothing even seemed out of place. We kept cleaning, but the noise started almost immediately. It kind of sounded like someone was shouting behind a wall of cement. I couldn't tell the gender. My brother told me he had been fine until I got there, that I could leave if I wanted. I totally did, and I didn't go back. My parents sold the house this year. During the interim of the move, they stayed in an Airbnb. My brother lived really close to his work, so he stayed in the house with the dog for a few weeks. This story is just his own, so I'm not sure if I believe it. Like I said, he's kind of strange, but he's also not really one to embellish. He had been hearing the usual things, even his name being called in the night, but ignored all of it. His friends had been coming over to keep him company. The last day he was supposed to finish moving, he brought another friend. He says he felt that they were being watched the whole time when they cleared the place out, and his friend left him to lock up. They got into the car facing the house when they noticed that the blinds were open. They were definitely closed on the way out. His friend claims that he saw them open from the corner of his eye. My brother says that there is a woman squatting in front of a downstairs window, close to where he had just left from. She was pale, her nose was hooked and her hair was black and stringy. Again, classic horror movie ghost. He said she had black eyes with visible white dots in the centers. Inside out eyes, as he called them. And she was smiling. He says it took him a second of shock to realize that she was looking directly at him. He felt sick, like she could walk right out and get him. They burned rubber when his friend snapped out of it, and they screamed at each other all the way down the road about what they saw. He called me right after to explain it, but I was with my own friends and not really willing to listen at the time. What messes me up is that my mom thought he had a psychotic break. He went into his room and cried all night at the Airbnb. She thought something had happened with his girlfriend. My brother is not a crier. I haven't seen him do that since we were little. When we got together and talked about it, his eyes teared up then, too. He said he didn't know why, but he knew that she wanted to kill him. He drew a picture of her. It's not great, but it still fills me with the deepest foreboding. It took me a while to realize that I saw her, too, just once in my bedroom almost five years ago. Suddenly it made sense. I knew it didn't feel like a woman, but it felt feminine, like something pretending to be a woman. My ex brought this up today. We dated all through high school and had a few experiences together that she recounts as her only paranormal encounters. I would love to still think that this was my own delusion, but it was shared by way too many people. Maybe a few things can be explained, but most of it truly can't. It has affected me so deeply that I'm still terrified that if I think too much about her, she'll follow us a state away. I'll just start with some history on the doll. I was told this by the previous owner. She was bought in Monroe, Connecticut, about 30-ish minutes away from the Warren's Occult Museum at a second-hand store. The owner who bought it felt like something was wrong with it and would often wake up with scratches and have nightmares every night. So she gave it to a friend to sell it on eBay, the man I purchased it from. 
the man selling it, had a few stories, like one for instance where he had family coming over so he hides the doll in an upstairs closet so his niece doesn't see it. The family slept downstairs, and the niece woke up at 3 a.m. crying from a nightmare and she described the doll he had upstairs. But she never went upstairs and had never seen the doll in person, didn't even know it was there. After that experience, he wanted to sell the doll and didn't feel safe with it, so he put it in a storage unit. The company he was using called him, asking for him to come and open the unit for them to prove that there was no animal or person in there, as the security guard had heard banging and movement in the storage locker at night. I am very interested in the paranormal, so I have a collection of Ouija boards, a haunted music box, and an exorcism kit from the 70s. So I decided to purchase this doll. When it first arrived, I took it out of the box, and all four of my dogs started growling very, very aggressively and moving backward away from the doll to clarify my dogs love everyone. If a stranger broke into my house to rob us, they would greet him with wagging tails and licks. This behavior was very odd for them. As I said earlier, I have an exorcism kit, and with this kit there's a cross that is almost locked in place with two pieces of metal. And around 30 minutes after removing the doll from the box, I heard a noise from upstairs. I went up to investigate, and it was the cross. The cross had been removed from the kit, and had fallen off of my shelf and onto the floor. I was the only one home, and all the dogs were downstairs with me, and my room door was closed. Ever since this experience, my family has been scared of the doll, so I put the doll back into the box and sealed it with salt and put it in the garage of my old house. I moved out with my girlfriend, and my family still lives there. I unfortunately forgot about it as I was packing in a hurry. I forgot to get stuff in the garage. After I moved, my mother moved into her now ex-boyfriend's house, and she put the doll in a shed. Not every night, but a lot of times throughout the week, they would look outside late at night, and the door to the shed would be open. One time when Logan went outside to close the door, he heard something move in the shed, so he went inside to check out what the noise was. When he was inside, he couldn't find anything that could have possibly made the noise, but he said he felt uncomfortable and cold, so he quickly went to leave, and just as he did, four truck tires that were sitting on a shelf fell right on top of where he had just been standing. Yes, this could have been a coincidence. But it felt like it wasn't, especially since the doll was also sitting on that shelf. After my mother broke up with Logan, she moved into an apartment and she put the doll in a closet. She's told me that nothing has really happened since, but when she's alone, she hears footsteps and knocks. The last few nights, she's been waking up around 3 a.m. hearing noises in her room, but can never see or find anything. I'll be visiting her in January, and will be bringing the doll back home with me when I leave. My wife and I were camping last night in Blue River Reservoir in Oregon. We camp here often and decided to explore up FSR 520 and found a cool, abandoned bridge far back in the woods over Cook Creek. The spot was beautiful and we were set up over the river on this long, abandoned bridge. If you've ever been in the Oregon woods, you know that they can give off a creepy vibe, and this was no exception, but it really was a dream campsite. Being 40 feet directly over a river while on a bridge with limbs growing everywhere over it isn't your everyday spot. I'll throw in for background that there was no one within at least three miles of us, and we had to hike our way in, approximately a tenth of a mile from where we had parked. We explored around the area for a bit, and didn't come across anything out of the ordinary besides a pair of shoes and a name, Mona, written in ash on a rock of the fire ring. While we were sitting by the fire, I noticed a very bright flash of light over the river and snapped my head up, but didn't see anything. A few moments later, I was paying closer attention and watched a ball of light float, even with the bridge 40 feet in the air, from one side to the other in the woods over 50 feet. The light was very blue. My thought at first had been somehow that headlights had come through, 
but I would have heard a car and no man-made light could get to us in this isolated area. This blue light was unlike anything I had ever seen. I mentioned it to my wife, but didn't want to freak her out, so I dropped the subject soon after. Later that night in the tent, we had the mesh lining up where we could see outside. My wife gasped and watched as the same blue light floated at the end of the bridge 30 feet away and hovered in the air. After a good bit of time, it shot off into the woods. It being late at night, we were obviously scared of someone's headlamp, but it shot away 40 times as quickly as any human could go, and we saw nothing attached. Our dog left the tent and stared at that exact spot for the next 10 plus minutes, while also peeking down the side of the bridge very seriously. I've always been pretty sensitive, and so have quite a few people in my family. I've seen dark figures, recorded a few voices, but nothing too major before this story. It was my senior year of high school, and I had been going through a period of what some may like to call paranormal investigating with my friends. We were spending time visiting cemeteries and abandoned houses, like most teenagers do. Just having fun being scared. Well, my friend Tyler found this Ouija board in an abandoned house that he had explored a month or so back and asked me if I wanted it. You see, he knew I was into the paranormal with all the love I had for being scared. I liked scary movies, haunted houses, and anything to get the adrenaline going. So of course I said yes. My friends Alex, David, and I decided to skip school, and I asked them if they wanted to use this Ouija board with me. They were along for the ride, and we had planned to find a place to do this. My house. My house was already known to be haunted, because due to some experiences that I had had in my basement. So it seemed like the appropriate choice. Now my friend David didn't believe in anything paranormal. No ghosts or any of that stuff. So he decided to film this for us. Alex is sitting across from me, and I have my hands on the eye by myself. I figured you weren't supposed to do this alone from what I had seen in movies, but we did it anyway, just to see what would happen. Alex begins to ask some questions. Basic ones at first, like, is there anyone here with us? What's your name? What do you want? Alex then asks, are you trying to hurt Chris? And nothing really happens in that moment, but I do remember this distinct chill run down my spine. I brushed it off. We decided to watch the video back on David's phone just to see what it looked like. As we're watching this back, when it comes to the question of, are you trying to hurt Chris? In the video, my head tilts back and I say, yes, in two different voices. One in my own voice, and one in a deep, guttural voice. We all look at each other and exclaim, oh my god. You didn't say that. You didn't say anything. And needless to say, we got rid of that board and never really talked about it again. But that was one of the most terrifying experiences I have ever had. In 2011, my older cousin bought a small, two-bedroom, single house in a quiet neighborhood for retired folks. The house was very small, with only 850 square feet of interior space, but it sat on a large plot of land. We could have easily fit two more houses like it on that lot, and still would have nice leftover space for yards and gardening. I was still a college student at that time, and I lived with my cousin. When he bought the house, I moved in with him. There were the two of us living there. According to the real estate agent, the house had been abandoned for around three years. The previous owner basically left it unmaintained and moved to a different state. The house had one main floor, a small attic, and an unfinished basement. The first time we walked in, the floorboards were already rotted out. We could see the basement through them. Everything was in horrible condition, and we would have to do major restoration to make it livable again. The property also had a small storage shed in the back of the lot. 
My cousin got a great offer, so he took the deal without much hesitation. Weird things started to happen when we began our restoration work. One day we were working on the bathroom. My cousin told me that he had to go to Home Depot for some stuff, and so he left. I heard him open the door, go outside, close it, turn on his car, and drive away. I was taking apart the old boards that were nailed on the bathroom walls. My back was facing the bathroom door. Five minutes after my cousin left, the bathroom door, which was open, started to slowly move to the closed position. I knew this because I could hear the creaky, old door sound that it made. I turned around and saw the door continue to close on its own. Then it stopped just as it touched the door frame and bounced back a little. I thought, maybe it's just the wind. Then, suddenly the door pulled itself shut tightly, as if there was someone on the other side of the door. It happened right in front of me. I was only four feet away. No wind could have done that. Plus, all the windows were closed around the house, so there couldn't possibly be any form of breeze. You might think that maybe the AC caused it, but no. This old house did not have central AC. We had to put in window AC units afterward. At this point, I thought my cousin was messing with me, so I called out to him, but there was no response. Just silence. I opened the door, continued to call for him, telling him to stop playing around. But my cousin was not there. I checked the parking lot, and he was, in fact, gone. I even got outside and did a perimeter check, but no one was there, and I still cannot explain what happened. After the restoration was done, we moved in. My cousin sometimes went on business trips for weeks, and there would just be me in the house. The following happened whenever I was alone. One night I was studying and had my headphones on. I heard sounds of someone walking around in the basement, which was directly below my bedroom. It sounded like they had slippers on, and I could hear the sound of them dragging on the concrete floor with each step. What's weird was that I could not pinpoint exactly which direction in which it was coming from. It's a strange sensation when the sounds were coming from the back of my head, as if they were just right behind me. The only reason that made me think that it's the basement was because the basement was the only area in the house that had concrete and that could have made the concrete slipper dragging sound. So I took out my headphones, and the sounds of the footsteps still went on. The volume of the sounds stayed the same, with or without the headphones. I thought my cousin had come home early, so I called out to him and got no reply. I took the flashlight and went to the basement to check it out. It was dark and quiet. No one else was there. This happened three or four more times within the first two months that I lived in that house. After that, I didn't experience anything unusual anymore. My cousin never felt or saw anything weird, but he seemed interested in my stories. His girlfriend, now wife, who had been to the house every other week or so, also expressed her uneasy feelings during her stays. By 2016, during a thunderstorm, the thunder struck our storage shed in the backyard and burned everything inside it. Luckily, the house was untouched. I came home from work only to find a police officer waiting at the front. He told me what had happened and said that it was an act of God and that our insurance would compensate for the loss. In our Asian culture, people say that when thunder strikes somewhere, often it is to strike down a malvoyant force or spirit. We quickly formed the realization that this thunder strike was more than just an accident. I got my own place and moved out a few months after the fire. My cousin bought another house with his wife a year after that. He still owns the creepy house, and it's been left unoccupied since 2017. He plans to tear down the old house and build a larger one to take advantage of the large plot of land. The experiences at this house were the closest I've got to what could be considered paranormal.
I bought three small clown statues several years ago from a thrift store. They came in a box of about a hundred other handmade clowns and I picked out the cutest ones. Last year I moved into a new house and put the three clowns in a large display case in my living room along with the other trinkets. The case is completely inaccessible to the elements and is sealed by two panes of sliding glass. I got a horrible wave of fear one night a few months ago, and for no apparent reason my first instinct was to check the display case. To my shock, I noticed that one of the clowns had turned 180 degrees around in the case and had positioned itself to look away from the living room. The glass had remained shut, and nothing else was out of the ordinary. I turned it back to face the right way and forgot about it until I felt the same wave of fear about a month later. Once again, I checked the case, and the same clown was turned the same 180 degrees around again. This has happened about five times now, and I'm starting to get really worried. I can't help but believe that it's a dark spirit or energy. I'm so freaked out. It's like the clown is trying to reach me, make me notice it, or perhaps get closer to the other objects in the case. I'm afraid to destroy it, move it, or touch it at all, because I don't want to absorb any energy or curse that it might contain. It was 1999, and I worked night shift in a factory back in Puerto Rico. One night it was just QC and me working in a back dark room of the factory. About 2.30 a.m. I saw a door open, and a pale young lady stepped in and walked in our direction. QC was facing the other way, and I was looking at her from my workstation. I stood up, and that's when I noticed that from the waist down, the woman was blurred. She was dressed in a light blue dress and a cap. As she got closer, she vanished into a mist. I rubbed my eyes and called the QC. I told her what I had just seen and she said, it's just your imagination playing tricks. After an hour or so had passed, this tall, dark shape dressed in a brown mechanics outfit got close to me looking over my right shoulder. I could see it with the edge of my eyes. It wasn't touching the floor. I froze, petrified. For about 30 minutes, it kept moving forward and backward. I finished the work night and went home spooked. Next day, I told my experience to everyone, and a mechanic who had worked there for years told me that when he stayed there, an old mechanic who had all kinds of issues was found hung in the same spot where I was working. I had to have a Ouija board for Christmas. My wife refused to buy one, so I did it anyway. One night, when my wife was out, my daughter and I tried to use the board. Nothing. The planchette didn't move at all, or if it did, I could feel my daughter pushing it. As I suspected, it's just a parlor game. Move ahead two weeks. While working in the garage on a guitar amplifier that I was building, I had a very strong feeling that I was being watched. As I had spent many hours previously on this project without any sensations, this was disturbing. It got so bad that I couldn't spend more than a minute or so in the garage after the initial encounter without the hairs on my neck going up. Then came the whispers. More like a shh, shh sound, actually. Kind of a be quiet between two or more people lurking about. This only happened when entering the garage from the house. And later when my daughter called me at work to say she heard shh shh when entering the darkened dining room. Since she was alone at the time, I blamed it on the cats. I too experienced it in the house, but usually only when entering the garage itself. 
Finally, I decided that enough is enough. I went into the garage one night and yelled at whoever was there that they had to leave because they were scaring the crap out of us. No more whispers after that. I wasn't yet into paranormal investigations at the time, so I didn't have a digital audio recorder to leave in the garage overnight. It bothers me now that I had real live spirits in the house to test with and I didn't have the equipment or the moxie to do anything. In high school, my friends and I were messing around with a Ouija board one night. We had done it before, and nothing remarkable had ever happened. We usually did it to try and scare each other or our girlfriends. We all thought it was a joke. That night, there was no one else home except the seven of us, and we were all together around the board. One of the girls there wanted to try it. She had never done it before. This time was different. The board misspelled some of the words the same way every time. It gave answers that seemed historically accurate for our town, things we never knew or never cared about. Long story short, the spirit claimed it was a ten-year-old boy who had died on the property in the 1800s and was buried there too in an unmarked grave. My friend's house was on a farm in the edge of town. We were all a little freaked out because the board had never been so detailed and consistent. However, we were still skeptical, and we were all assuming one of us was trying to scare the rest. Finally, my friend asked if the spirit could do something to prove he was there with us. It went to yes, and then spelled out knock. Then the planchette stopped moving. We all just stared at it silently, and then there was a rap, rap, rap on the window right next to us. The lights were on outside, and there was absolutely no one there. We never touched that effing board again. From as early as I can remember, I used to fall asleep watching old, reel-to-reel black-and-white cartoons on my wall, like Steamboat Willie. I clearly remember the jittery, shutter-like quality of the cartoon from the old reel-to-reel -reel projector. There was no actual movie projector in my room. At night, I would wake up to someone tapping me on the shoulder. I had a usual routine that I followed when it happened, which involved burying myself under my covers and telling myself that I would count to seven and then turn over to see what was there. Not sure if there's a significance to seven. To this day, I like to end things with seven. For example, I set my alarm at 627 and not 630. But anyhow, I would go through the counting routine multiple times. I wanted to see what was there, but I was a kid and didn't really want to see what was there. My mom would tell me that I just needed to confront it and tell it to leave me alone. It took years to build up that courage. I don't remember exactly how long, but I must have been in my early teens before I actually did get the nerve up to turn over right away and tell it to leave me alone and stop tapping me on the shoulder. Once I confronted it, it did stop. Then comes my baby sister when I was 15. She would wake up screaming in the middle of the night quite often. Once she was old enough to talk, she said that she was scared of the hand that came up between her wall and the bed and tapped her on the shoulder at night. I was making rounds in the dark hall of the nursing home, mostly to help out with incontinence and bathroom breaks. There's only one aide per hall. I went into the room of two ladies. One was sound asleep, the other was awake. She had some slight dementia. The curtains are attached to the ceiling for privacy, much like a hospital. I went into her side of the curtains, leaving a small gap open and told her that I was there to help her. 
She said, okay, but can you please close the curtains all the way? I don't want him to see us. I immediately got goosebumps and asked, who? And she said, the man right there with the hat. And I followed her pointed finger to the small gap in the curtain that I had left open. I could see that there was a mirror, and in the reflection of that mirror, an empty chair facing us. I immediately closed the curtain and was slightly nervous for the rest of my shift. This just happened about 30 minutes ago. I was in the kitchen, and as I turned around, the very strong scent of my mom's distinct perfume hit me in the face. This happened three times. Now, my mother had an unusual mix of perfume she used to wear, and was known to wear a lot of it. Also, she had a hint of air fresheners that she also had a lot of in her house. Mom passed away over two years ago and had never been to this house. We've only lived here 18 months. And we don't have anything here that smells the same as that. It was so strong and so distinct that my heart immediately pounded and I shouted to my partner, I can smell my mother. I thought I saw something climb the stairs earlier today too, but passed it off as my eyes playing tricks on me. Now, I think there may be more to it. I live in an old house that was made during the 70s. When I moved in, everything was fine, until last week. Last week, I was home chilling on my bed reading a book when I heard a noise from the room next to mine. This room is where I keep old possessions from my grandma in the closet. There was one that always crept me out. Some old doll. The noise sounded like a bang, like a closet door being slammed. I went into the room to check and found the closet door wide open with stuff all over the floor. That doll was sitting there. It was sitting there looking at me. 